Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are rejoined by my esteemed friend, Professor Paul Taylor. Thank you for coming in. I was never made a professor, by the way. Sorry to argue with you from the get-go. You are a professor. <laughs> I don't care what they say. I say. Um, so uh, before we get started, we're going to be talking about Insta Angst today. I just want to go back to a conversation we had about nine months ago and um, apologize in a way, because you said we live in a post-literate uh, uh, culture and that that was a problem. And I couldn't for the life of me see what the big problem was. Now, that we, I was actually in Dubai when we had that conversation. Mm -hmm. So now it might actually be a year later. I can't see why I couldn't see it at the time. So that idea has stuck with me. The fact that we're not reading books uh, as a culture generally and just how important book reading is and just how much of an advantage you have when you read books has become way more clear to me over the last nine months to the point where I believe when I'm talking to people, I can tell whether people are reading or not. And when I say reading books, they could be reading young adult vampire fiction. So any, any book, any book versus no books, I think you can tell the difference. And I do see now it's a it's a big, big problem. But when you presented it to me, I was like, I don't really see why that's a problem. Particularly what you said to me about reading books that you don't like, reading books that make you uncomfortable. And you even gave me a quote from somebody that was about hacking at the ice of a oh, it's, frozen ocean. Yeah, it's Franz Kafka. And I, I've mess I tend to run it's it's a paragraph that he wrote, and I think I run the two the whole quote together, but it's along the lines of um, a, a book should be like an axe for the frozen sea within us. It should stab and hurt us. It's so I, that might not be totally accurate. It might be across a paragraph, but it was just basically, unless a book did hurt you and trigger mm. you, mm. then there wasn't much point reading, which is the op exact opposite yes. of today's climate. So I said to you, uh, when you invited me to read uh, Metamorphosis, and uh, I complained to you that I wasn't enjoying it. What was your response? Well, it was a completely spontaneous response. I thought, what's he talking about? What, I, what's enjoyment got to do with it? What is this weak Western decadence? Enjoy? But can I can I ask you a question? And it's yeah. like, I'm guessing that when, when people go to the gym, they mm. get in, because as I've joked before, I obviously don't. Mm. But um, you get an endorphin fix and people yeah. get addicted to that. Yeah. But would it be fair to say there's often when people do exercise, it, it, they might get an afterglow, mm. but while they're doing it, it can actually be quite unenjoyable. Or am I... Because I the, wouldn't know. I the, more, the more unenjoyable it is, uh, the better results you're going to get and the more of an endorphin uh, serotonin payoff you're going to get the, at the end of the workout. So do you see how I could see a parallel with reading? 100%. 100%. Because, but my point would, so I keep saying my point would be, so you have to punch me every time I say my point. Um, what I'd like to say is that in a gym scenario, mm -hmm. no one would question the idea that it's hard work, it's painful, and it may not be enjoyable. Yeah. But the minute you pick up a book, mm -hmm. somehow exercising your mind, you and I have discussed, uh, you know, the Greeks before mm -hmm. and how they exercise and physical mm -hmm. and mental exercise were matched for them. Mm. almost indivisible. Yes. Whereas we've divided, um, you may have to do some intellectual work for your job mm. or you may get well paid for certain intellectual skills. But in terms of your private life, we are running away from exercising our brains because we're tired, we're fed up. Yeah. You want a complete break. Yeah. Whereas people will go to the gym and put themselves through physical hell. Yes. There is this mismatch now. Yeah, there is. There is. And I think, um, there's a different way of conceptualizing book reading and literature, which is, um, did the Jews refer to themselves as those who wrestle with God? Well, that's from the, uh, Jacob, doesn't Jacob have a fight with the, with, uh, what he thinks is an angel, but I think, I can't remember if it's an angel or God. Yeah. It's, but it's, it's, I think it was Jacob actually wrestles with God. So there is, there is, let's say like, um, there's virtue in wrestling with ideals and ideas and of course wrestling is uncom it's combative and it maybe maybe there should be more of that of a rugged approach to literature if if I, if I could say that where it there should be a combative element because that's how you learn it shouldn't just be 
easy. Well, it can be easy. Like you want to read Harry Potter and switch off. That's absolutely fine. But you should read challenging books. Well, I'd, I'd divide it into two. There's, you've used the word combative, which mm-hmm. I think would be, I think you and I are equally obsessed with the concept of the Socratic method. Mm-hmm. So there's questioning. And I think it's, I came across the phrase for the first time the other day. I think it's called Mauretic the Mauretic process, M-A-U-R-E-T-I-C, which refers to the Socratic method. Right. And it's the idea that Socrates had this idea, you want to bring out, people have latent knowledge Mm. and you have to engage with them through dialogue to bring out their latent knowledge Mm. and make them realise. And most good teachers realise the best way to teach people is to challenge them to find out what they already know but are keeping down or have never thought about. To draw it forward. To draw it out. So that's Mm. the combative, let's have a dialogue. And the dialogue can be challenging. The dialogue can be constructive. We Mm. tend to have constructive dialogues Mm. because we agree on everything. Yes. But we could have, if we find something we disagree on, it would hopefully be respectful, but you go backwards and forwards. Yes. And you learn to hone an argument. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the combative aspect. But then I take it back to the gym again. And if you're, so if you were doing mixed martial arts, it's, it's, combat. Mm -hmm. So that would fit your analogy perfectly. But if you're doing solo exercise in the gym, my understanding is, and I think I might have mentioned this before to you, uh, you need resistance. I'd I'd concentrate on the word resistance. Okay. So if you're to build muscle, you need to slightly damage your existing muscle. How Mm -hmm. do you do that? Through oppositional weights. So opposition, resistance, Mm. force, Mm. Um, So the idea that when you learn or read a difficult book, it's Mm. the same principle. Mm. Unless, so you and I have talked about things and sometimes one of us, it could be either of us, doesn't quite understand something. And this is what I'll be talking about later on. That to me is good. Mm. But we, again, we live in a culture whereby resistance and obstruction in an exercise sense is understood as part of the process. Mm -hmm. But if you don't understand something within two minutes, Mm then you throw the book in the corner. When I tell people that Blood Meridian is one of my favourite books of all time and I read it again and again, and I say this on a YouTube video, they'll be like, why would you love such a depressing, nihilistic, gory book? And I'm like, I love the way it makes me feel. It's horrifying, it's bewildering, it's fantastical, and it gives you this, when you go through the book and you get to the ending, it leaves a wound in your psyche. Kafka. Okay. It's broken the ice, the frozen sea within you. So that's one aspect. The other aspect, and I need to check this with you because it's my own little homemade. I've no idea whether in a clinical setting or anything it would make any sense. Mm. But I could, sorry to give you such a ridiculously bad example, but um, phobia with spiders, arachnophobia. Mm-hmm. At least one cure is eventually they work with you to desensitize you. Mm-hmm. But isn't the end result they try and put you in a tank full of tarant- tarantulas or something similar? Expo- they put your hand in a, a tank and that's yeah. when you know you're cured. Exposure therapy. Yeah. yeah. And it's what, or is, it, is, is aversion therapy something different? Uh, I'm not sure what aversion therapy. Could you look that up? Calvin, aversion therapy. But yeah, it, in fact... Like, but the general principle is to desensitize you, but to yes. desensitize you, you have to be exposed to the thing that you fear. Correct. And they do, even with um, aversion therapy as a type of behavioral therapy that involves repeat pairing and unwanted, uh, aversion therapy is like every time- Oh, that's right. Every yeah. time you eat the, what's the donut? You yum like? nut. The yum nut. <laughs> yeah, give, you a little, give you an electric shock and you're like, uh, no more no more Nigerian Guinness and yum nuts for me. That's enough. Um, no exposure <laughs> therapy. They've, they've done this. Um, there's a good thing they did with uh, people with combat related PTSD and it sounds so simple and apparently they get really good results with it they put them on a treadmill and then they have uh, the kind of combat scenarios they would have faced in Afghanistan or Iraq on a TV screen. And then the, the whole therapeutic process is they're walking towards the fearful thing. And if I remember it correctly, they basically just bring the screen closer. How do you feel? I feel okay at this distance. And then they work at that distance. We brought it closer. Do you still feel okay? Yes. I've, and it just brings it slowly, closer, closer, closer to their physical subjective reality until they can still feel safe and not shocked and inside of their own bodies, even with that triggering stimuli going on. So yeah, that does. Well, but this is quite people. topical because I think Jonathan Haidt, is that how you say his name? Haidt? Haidt? H-A-I-D-T. Haidt. Haidt. Yeah. The Americans always say Haidt when yeah. they interview him. And he's just released a book, which I haven't read yet, just full disclosure, but I think it's called The Generation of Anxiety. We could do a whole session just with that title, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> but my, what I'm trying to say is that it's topical. It's yeah. very topical. Yeah. And people have known, you know, I'm not 
I'm dissing Jonathan Haidt. He's much more articulate than I am. But when I was, you know, doing research on technology and society decades ago, mm. I could see a lot of this coming. Mm. But the, the whole idea about anxiety and the, the whole new generation, but this is a whole generation of young people and it's association, um, correlation is not causality. Mm. So I'm not claiming I can prove it. Mm. But it, it does seem to be very coincidental that the younger anxious generation mm. tend not to read. Yeah. They're not exposed to dark, darkness. Mm. Mm. Um, and if ever I do any public talks in the future, I'd love to come on to, you know, it's it's like, what would your dart song be? When they come on to the darts, oh, they yeah. all have a, mine would be Simon and Garfunkel, Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> of course it would. Of course it would. <laughs> but there's a serious point. Yeah. I, like you, and can I put this in context? Because again, I need your free psychological advice. I'm convinced I am, I, you've, you've heard of seasonal adjustment depression. Mm -hmm. And I read somewhere that 10% of all sufferers of it mm -hmm. have it in the summer. Oh. Because, and I actually think I may have it. Oh, wow. Because okay. the happiest I've been in my life was a Finland in November. Really? When there isn't even any snow. So it's as dark as dark darkness. can be. Darkness. I want only darkness. But it, it is interesting. I feel miserable in the summer because I've psychologically, I've been on um, summer holidays to places mm. and everyone's frolicking, the sun's out, and mm. I feel this overwhelming pressure to be happy. I, I see why you were friends with Zizek. Yeah. I could really see him just going, this stupid happiness everywhere. I hate it. Well, Obscenity. I, <laughs> I spent a month in Tampere. In yeah. Finland, yeah. and it was, they, it was a, they, they renovated a tower from an old polytechnic. Yeah. And they nicknamed it because I was the first guest to stay there for four weeks, and yeah. they called it Taylor's Tower. <laughs> and I was alone. It was a massive yeah. old cotton mill. Mm. So out of hours, I was in this, like, a mad person in the, the attic. And did you feel very comfortable in that archetypal role? And I, they had a window out one out the little office they had, and it went, it looked onto the, I don't know what they call them, fields in Finland, but just the, the, the swamp land. Yeah as far as the eye could see, and mm. it was just permanently grey. Because like I say, mm. if it snowed, there's a bit of whiteness, but it hadn't snowed. Mm. So it was as grey could grey could be. And I was walking around Tampere Town Centre where they're all thinking, oh, winter's starting. Mm. And big grin on my face, they thought I was on drugs. <laughs> because I didn't feel the pressure to be happy. Right. There was no super ego injunction to enjoy. No, you it was adjust. everyone's miserable. I'm, I must be a reverse emotional vampire. It's like everyone's <laughs> miserable. I, so seasonal effect. So the free psychology advice would be your 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 seasonal affective disorder brings out your oppositional defiance syndrome. That's what's happening here. You just love everyone is miserable. I can make happy. <laughs> now, one of the reasons I wanted your psychological advice is what's interesting is one of the good things about when we keep coming back to talk to each other. Mm. It's what you said about you have a you have a notion and then you've thought about it mm. and then you can come back. And, th and talk about it again. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of, um, I find a lot of stuff on YouTube is quite repetitive mm. because you'll talk to someone about a topic that's topical. Yes. And they'll get another person to talk about a very similar topic and they very rarely get that person back. So yeah. there's no sense of development. Right. Yeah. And what I'm, I'm genuinely interested in because what I've got from our talks is mm. I've always, I think, had an inkling that I'm quite an odd person. <laughs> but seeing in your eyes messages going across like ticker tape saying, yeah. this guy's bloody odd, <laughs> <laughs> made me think about yeah. why I might be odd. Right. Because my, my wife's stupid woman picked me, so mm. she can't think I'm that odd. Mm. But I, I don't have that many close friends because I, I, I find, you know, I'm misanthropic. Mm. So, but so there's no one around to tell me how odd I am. Right. But you reflected that back to me. Mm. So I was thinking about that and part of being odd can be good and mm. part of it, you know, you need to get a handle on because mm -hmm. it's quite disturbing. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I found that interesting to have something reflected back to you. Yeah. Um, which, like I say, is one of the good aspects but this, so why I was asking about this, the, the potential seasonal adjustment depression, which sounds like a cop out to mm. me. I, th I think it's effective. Seasonal effective. Seasonal effect, effective, the yeah. Disorder, yeah. Um, but so I wondered, I was half joking that I mm. might have that syndrome. Mm. But it, I, I, I've only ever met one person, and ironically, she was a dental hygienist mm. who was doing my mouth at the time. The and highest, I mentioned the highest rates of depression and uh, suicide. Well, honestly, is that if, true? Of a profession, yes. Well, it was just, it was, it was springtime. 
<laughs> this is a lovely chat round. Right? <laughs> Apart from psychiatrists, actually, oddly enough. But go, go on, sorry. Why would scratching the gunk out of people's teeth get you down? I have no idea. <laughs> Every day, all day. <laughs> well, for American viewers or listeners, it, yeah. North Wales is not the most sun-drenched part of the universe. It is not. So this was approximately springtime. And it mm. sounds like springtime for Hitler, but mm. springtime in North Wales. <laughs> And we were, and everyone around us was beginning to get as excited as Welsh people can get about <laughs> the impending summer. And um, she was looking really miserable. And I said, what's up with you? And she said, summer's around the corner. Yeah. And we just bonded. It was like, yeah, it really pisses me off too. Because <laughs> we were coming out of our happy time. Yes. And then yeah. all these gormless, and the, if, if American or North American viewers want to be a bit more sympathetic to my point of view, yeah. another downside of British summer is British men wearing shorts. Oh, yes. Which it, it should be. You know, all these hate laws they've got now. Yes. Can't they just introduce a no shorts law? That should be classed as a hate crime. Oh, <laughs> it's a, an optical crime. Bloody pasty, hell. pasty white man. And then what, well, the piece de resistance um, or pierre de resistance is the um, sandals with socks mm, mm. and shorts. Mm. And there's a certain hue, you know, if you had a Dulux colour chart mm -hmm. of British men's white legs. <laughs> It's just a unique shade of white. It's bluer than Nosferatu's arse, as I once. <laughs> Someone called me. But anyway, I think I've digressed. So um, there's, there's, uh, there's pleasure in... in mis well, I think one of the themes that we're going to be going around today is the necessity for, uh, you said resistance, um, and maybe the necessity for unhappiness, misery, discomfort. Well, one of the people I've started reading, I, I, I tried years ago and I found it really, really difficult. And I've read philosophy for a living, mm. but Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher from... A f Speaking of the joy of despair. <laughs> exactly. So he popularised, I think in Danish it's Angest. I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's A-N-G-E-S-T. And in German, it's much more well-known, angst. Mm. And in it's one of those idiomatic phrases. So in... Um, we use the word in English mm. because there isn't a perfect, it's like schadenfreude or machismo mm. or deja vu. Mm. Uh, words in another language that just somehow encapsulate what isn't in your own language. Mm -hmm. And angst has this indefinable, uh, it's dread, anxiety, mm. but it's not quite either of those. You'd have to be Danish to fully <laughs> understand it. Yep. Yep. And, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because you've got a psychological background, is the extent to which my understanding of it is generalised anxiety disorder, for example, as the name would imply, is a general sense of unease. Mm -hmm. But it still has specific foci or mm -hmm. focus. You know, there'll be a focus. Mm -hmm. So you're anxious about getting up for work and you're anxious about something that's happening tomorrow. And But it's, it's, it's general in the sense there's lots of things, mm. but they are identifiable things. Is that correct? Uh, usually, yeah. Um, and then within that, uh, some psychologists would say some of these things are mis misattributed. So the client is saying, oh, I'm anxious about getting up for work. But actually what it is, is they have free-floating anxiety. And then the brain post hoc tries to find the source for it, which is natural. You go, well, I must be anxious about something. What could it be? What is over me? And they're like, oh, I'm anxious about work. I'm anxious about paying the mortgage or whatever. So, yeah. Well, Soren Kierkegaard had this, I think it could have been his first book. It's called The Concept of Anxiety. Mm -hmm. And unless I've got mixed up, I think it might have actually been his university dissertation. I might, I might have got that wrong. Apologies. But it's called The Concept of Anxiety. Um, and But it, it is not a dictionary encyclopedia definition of anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to follow. But part of his, his argument is, that, or a consequence of his argument is that we have this, um, sorry, I'm going backwards before I talk about Kierkegaard, but the ancient Greeks, part of their definition, quite a few ancient Greek philosophers said the purpose of philosophy is another cheery one, mm -hmm. is to practice, to, I think the phrase was practice towards death. Mm -hmm. So that was their definition of philosophy, it's practicing mm. for death. Mm -hmm. And Kierkegaard agreed with that. And his idea was he, he was from a very Christian, a, a, an idiosyncratic, but a Christian theological point of view. Mm -hmm. So he believed you had to get grace through a Christian life. But I think it's applicable to the vast majority of people. His concept of angst was anxiety, dread. It's ultimately about we have to confront the fact we're mortal. Mm -hmm. 
Now, to go back, right back to some of the things you were saying from the get-go, uh, Greek tragedy mm. is about people dying or people suffering terrible fate. Mm. Uh, the art I'll be showing later is about some miserable things. Mm. But this is the only way, Kierkegaard, I think, would argue, is the only way you can prepare for death in a positive way mm. is to confront these things. Yeah. Is to meet this resistance. Other, and the corollary is, the consequence of not doing that is that, and you need to tell me whether you think this is psychologically insightful or just nonsense, but I think this generation of anxious people, mm. they're constantly postponing the process that good literature and art makes you go through. So they're mm. having tablets or they're being cosseted. Their parents won't allow them to have negative things happen. Mm. They're not allowed to take risks. Mm. They're triggered. Um, and I've had two anecdotal examples, two different people, because I, don't, like I said, I don't go out much. Um, <laughs> so I have to rely on secondhand information. But just sitting in restaurants mm. and people of my generation have heard young people, they've, they've not been deliberately earwigging, but you know, when you're in a, space and you can't help but hear. Mm. And they'll say, young people now, you can tick off on a piece of paper the number of times they talk about mental health. Yeah. Their mental health. Yeah. And it's almost like that they're, they're talking about it as a substitute or an alibi for not actually having to do anything about it. The, yes. Okay. So I think um, the, there's one of the things I, I wanted to ask you, which is relevant to what you've just said. With Kierkegaard, the concept of angst and despair, the positive side of despair and angst as he defined it, didn't he say it was a, it it spoke well of the person's character if they did despair? Because if a person was in despair, they could return to God or a godly Christian path. But if they did not despair, then there's there's really no hope for them. Yeah. That's, it's part that's, of that, that's the Christian theology aspect, the redemptive aspect of it. The redemptive it. aspect. These, so what I would say, it's not my job to defend this generation or these kids, but what I would say, or maybe would suggest in defense of that, of what they're doing, there is no redemption for them because there's no religious meta narrative beyond, it's a purely material, we're at peak consumer capitalism. This is exactly what I want to talk about with images later, but what what I um, how I'd link it to art and literature is that for the, lots of viewers and listeners won't be religious. Mm. And we've had this chat, neither mm. of us have faith. Mm. I wish I did, I just mm. don't have it. Mm. But we were both brought up in a Catholic tradition, so we know mm. what it looks like. Mm -hmm. But if I would say, forget about being religious for a second, which is quite a large forget. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I think there's a concept of transcendence. Mm -hmm. That is that can be slightly separate from religion. Yes. So art, it, it's it's very it's very separate from religion. It's beyond religious dogma for sure. Yeah, but art can give you a form of transcendence that may not be the same as a god figure, mm -hmm. but it gives you the sense of transcendence that you're saying. If correct me if I'm wrong, the younger generation lack. Yes. So I would say they don't just lack a, a sense of God, mm. which is true. Our yeah. society is now largely godless. Yeah. But there's also just a, a concomitant lack of transcendence in any form. Yes. Yeah, so my my point would have been at the white belt level, oh, they don't have religion, they don't have God. But ultimately, religion and God should lead to what your point is at the black belt level, which is it should be transcendent. Without trans... Uh, without, so we have in um, the psychoanalytic tradition, we have, there's different wills. There's wills to power, wills to survival, will to pleasure, I think was Freud. But one psychoanalyst who's, who I can't remember, he he actually posited the idea of the will to transcendence. And I think that is the supra will of all the other wills for humanity. There is a strong, powerful evolutionary drive to transcend. And if that's not explored or expressed in any way without any capacity to explore or express it, yeah, you'll have a generation of very mentally ill, fragile feeling kids because Ugh, we're just, what, little meat sacks on a rock? I don't feel good. Give me pills. Give me endless social media. Give me pornography, anything. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll avoid going down this particular avenue, but mm. I just want to mention it. I've, I've been mm. reading a bit recently about uh, neurotheology. What is this new well, we, depravity? We need, we need to do a whole session on this. <laughs> neurotheology? Neurotheology. It what it more. is, no, but it's neuroscientists mm. of very legitimate American, mostly the ones I've been reading have been American directors of health centers in America. Mm. 
Um, they're basically neuroscientists looking at brain scans, etc. Mm -hmm. And they're finding, they're not claiming there's a part, it's not me mechanistic, there's a part of the brain that makes you religious. Mm. But they are saying when you do brain scans, like when you've seen a stimulated brain, mm -hmm. lobes light up in certain network patterns. Mm -hmm. And they're saying when people have religious experiences, you can have something similar. And they're arguing increasingly that there's there are, I think, um, and, and it's interesting, Part of the, the the part of the brain that's affected by all this, if I can remember correctly, is what's called the parietal lobe. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is cave art is called parietal art. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it must be to do with the walls and the cave shape. But it's back to your point about how this uh, desire for transcendence, how primeval it is. So the cave painting, paintings in Lasso in France. So you're saying that parietal art is called parietal art because the inside of the cave looks like the part well, of the Well, isn't, isn't pares, isn't la the Latin for wall? Pared in Spanish, maybe, yeah. Yes, I'm thinking it's, um, but sorry, I should know this, but I th I'm thinking it's the parietal lobe, but parietal art is because it's on the wall. Okay. And so how it got into being the parietal lobe, I'm not quite sure. I'm not, I know next to nothing about biology. The neurologists will be jumping down in the comments section. Yeah, no, but <laughs> please, I'm absolutely ignorant that you're beyond belief when it comes to biology or science. Me too. So, um, but the, this, neuro, this is why I'm quoting these neuroscientists. But the, the idea that the, um, the art, I always thought that the, the cavemen were, um, and women, were painting the art in order to, um, you know, pray. So I'll paint I'll paint the the ox that will then go and hunt. Mm -hmm. That was my primitive, ironically, mm -hmm. understanding. Mm -hmm. And then what, the, at least one theory is that what they were doing was they're in an altered state of consciousness mm -hmm. because they've gone from the surface. Mm -hmm. They've gone deep into the caves and mm -hmm. they really were deep. They've got incredibly basic lighting. Mm -hmm. And they had apparently bones with holes in that they'd make a thrumming sound with. They'd, mm -hmm. So you'd have uh, repetitive music or drums. Mm. So it would be the um, sense isolation. Mm. You've gone deep into the earth, it's mm. dark, mm. and they may have taken hallucinogens, mm. who knows. Mm. So they're having altered states of consciousness. Mm. And apparently there are two states whereby anyone in an altered state will see certain geometric patterns. Yes. And this is true of any... Uh, culture. It's mm -hmm. culture and uh, free. Mm -hmm. Any, it's almost like there's a biological like floaters in your eyes. Mm -hmm. If you're in a certain altered consciousness, there are certain geometric patterns mm -hmm. all human beings have been recorded as seeing. Yeah. Aboriginal people in Australia, yeah. the other side of the world. But the other, so that's non-figurative. The figurative things people see in an altered state of consciousness are what's around in their culture. You're right. So when they were painting these animals, it was actually, it was just what they were used to seeing. Mm -hmm. So they weren't trying to pray to it or we will focus on this because we want to go out and kill it. Mm. They were just capturing, trying to capture images mm. and put them on a wall. I see where you're going with this. And this is, but the idea and is- that was the first example of Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> actually, yes. That's Instagram. Well, it is, except... Paleolithic. Paleolithic Instagram. Yeah. But it's not angst-ridden because it, and these neuroscientists are saying that there's a vortex in the head. You go down these mental processes like them crawling through narrow... Often these, these halls, they paint the pictures. You had to go through a narrow path first. Mm -hmm. And ironically, it parallels the vortex you mentally go through before you have your altered state of consciousness. Right. But they were doing this. These cave people, why were they going from the surface deep? Mm. So they were going, I think the Greeks call it catabasis. You go deep down. Mm. It's like a descent into hell. Mm -hmm. And anabasis is the, is the ascent up. Mm. So Because they went deep down so they could have an altered state of consciousness so they could then visualize their brains were developing art and language and they were developing a sense of the beyond. Mm -hmm. So at the most basic, basic uh, primeval paleolithic level, we've always had this desire to transcend. Is I'm backing up what you're saying. Yes. But the Instagram is you're stuck in the cave. Yeah. And it's an eternal now. And there's no, what you, you've said that there's no sense of God. There's no sense of the beyond this new generation. Yeah. Everything's the here and now. And as we'll talk about later, everything's reflections back of yourself. 
There are so many loops that I want to close here. Calvin, could you put the parietal lobe back up, uh, parietal, the superior parietal lobule? There's a word, lobule. Yeah. And inferior parietal lobule are the primary areas of body or spatial awareness. Oh, so that's where your proprioception yeah. comes from. A lesion commonly in the right superior or inferior parietal lobule leads to hemineglect. hemineglect. Bloody hell, this is why I stay away from neurology. The name comes from the parietal bone, which is named from the Latin peris, meaning wall. Okay. Um, I'll keep it brief. You, you, obviously, uh, Zizek is a psychoanalyst by trade, but I think before a philosopher, wasn't he? He was a trained psychoanalyst. I, I'm not sure he's actually ever trained as a psychoanalyst. He does a psychoanalytical theory, but he's basically a philosopher, yeah. So the, um, obviously that comes from Freud and everybody knows Jung. Adler was one of their peers. But with Freud and Jung, they originally, uh, what, I can't remember which one of them actually wanted to be an archaeologist by profession. And then the other one of them was very interested in archaeology. So what I always say with uh, psychoanalytic theory is it's an effort to go uh, down and in and back. So you go into the ground, you dig up the old ancient remnants of childhood or in, in, in Egypt, the old mummies. You see the hieroglyphics on the wall, you decode them, and then you bring from darkness into the light. So it's that yin-yang thing. It's very yin. So psychoanalysis and therefore psychotherapy is very yin. And I claim that therefore it's good and necessary, but it is infected with the ideology of yin. So what you just said is, like reading the cave wall when we're subsumed in social media, Instagram, TikTok, we're in yin. And so there are yin coordinates there. And what we know is that, because you mentioned anxiety, yin coordinates, or I'm being careful not to say female or feminine, um, there is more negative affect in the yin coordinates. It's more anxious. It's more depressive. There's, there's just generally more negative emotion to be dealt with in that space. And so if your yin is necessary, but yang as the counterbalance is also necessary. So if you're in, down in the dark only, you will end up more anxious because you're not experiencing yourself as yang. So yesterday, little example, I was in the house working. It was a dark day and I stayed in the house on my laptop and I was having these, I was worried. I was worried about my Spanish visa. Or I was getting stressed about the seminar and I just didn't feel very good. And I was faced with a set of problems and my emotional response was, I'm not sure if I can handle this and I'm a bit stressed and I missed therapy this week. I go outside and I drive to the gym and as I'm driving, so driving, I'm active, I'm in control, I'm out of the house and I'm going somewhere. I think about the same problems and my brain comes back with the automatic response of, well, you just deal with them. If there's a fight, you'll win or you won't. And if you don't win, you'll recruit some help and you'll you'll get on with it. So there's this, um, there's this, I'm not saying one is superior to the other. If you only have yang, you know this in Chinese philosophy, if there's too much yang in Chinese medicine, the body dies. If there's too much yin, the body dies. You need balance. It's not that one is superior to the other. Yin is where we rest. If we just exercise and go to the gym and don't rest, you will die. But you have to have balance. When you go out into yang, you give yourself the opportunity when you're not thinking about the hunt. You think, oh, is my spear going to be sharp enough? What if the, what if the pig gores me or kills someone? You're in a much more fearful state than when you're outside and doing, and you think, I'll handle this or I won't. It'll be all right either, which is probably a stupid way to think. But if you're going to be a hunter gatherer or a warrior or a soldier, you do need that level of delusion to think, yeah, people are going to die in this war, but it won't be me because I'm special. You need that level of narcissistic delusion. And I think it's not too much to say. So I've drawn this distinction in psychology uh, where people said we have NPD, we have narcissistic personality disorder, which is rigidly yang. You're always out, you're always in the limelight, you're always in the light. Yang is light, yin is dark, and you're always transmitting. And I've said codependency as a sort of a mirror image of that disorder is you're always in the cave. I've, I've, I've 
pre- pre- uh, presented that as a as a hypothetical model, and you're always receding back into the darkness because you're frightened of of being seen. And I've also claimed that broad scale in our culture, everybody's saying narcissism, narcissism, it's vanity, it's vanity, and it's a pandemic of narcissism. But I actually think the bigger pandemic is codependency. It's the yin. We're infected with rigid yin, not with rigid yang. I mean, whatever, we're out of balance. Um, So when you were talking about the cave and the cave drawings and the images, this is necessary. It's our way... I think it's the gateway to mysticism. It's the gateway to the, to the subjective. And that's why practical behavioral psychologists hate psychoanalysis. Well, you can't measure that. You had a dream about your dead grandfather on a boat. Who cares? I can't measure that. I can't see it. But we in the yin psychoanalytic space, we like the symbols. And you said, do you like exploring images? Of course. Psychoanalyst in me is going to give you a thousand and one potential dream symbology. This is a penis. This is a, you know, this is the dead mother, whatever. So I do like it, but I'm aware as a person who works in psychology that I have to get out. I have to get out because I will become neurotic. You know, this, it's an outmoded. Mm. We don't say neurotic anymore. It's outmoded, but I think it's a useful thing to say. You're too introspective. You're too, too much in that space. And culturally, that's where we're up to. But could I ask, I think my slight spin on that would be my sense is Kierkegaard is saying, welcome your neurosis. But the point is, in the the type of neurosis you're describing that I'd labeled, you know, the, mm. the generation of anxiety, mm. it's what we'll talk about in a minute. It's the circularity. Yes. It's not going anywhere. Whereas I would argue there are forms of neurosis where you battle with it. It's your yin and yang. You battle with the neurosis. You accept the neurosis as inescapable, mm-hmm. but you don't succumb to it. So if I can give you a very practical example, in yep. my life, I've if you talk about transcendent experiences, mm. just up the road, I, I, it might be because I'm completely biased because I was brought up Catholic, mm. but the Liverpool Catholic Cathedral, mm. if you go in, I think it's uninspiring from the outside, Paddy's Wigwam. Yeah, Paddy's Wigwam. Yeah. You go inside, mm. I find it an inspiring transcendent space. Yeah. And I don't know if anyone who's not had a religious upbringing, that may be lost on them. Mm. So that's one example. But um, in an art sense, in the National Gallery in Edinburgh, mm-hmm. there's a Monet painting, which I think he did a series called Haste, Stacks. And this one, I think, is called Frost Effect. Mm. And it's brilliant, the Scottish uh, gallery, because none of the locals ever go, because mm. they're all vitamin D deficient and rickets, and they can't <laughs> stagger in. Um, <laughs> and it's it's Scotland, so you don't get that. In certain months, you don't get any tourists in your way. So I was on my own, which is the way I like to be. <laughs> and the haystacks, it's the Frost Effect. And I've got very expensive art books. Mm that don't do it justice. You Mm. have to physically be stood in front of it. And all the only way I can describe it is, and it sounds daft, it's a painting of a haystack. Mm. How transcendent and sublime can this be? Mm. But the way he's done it is the the sun or the the light glimmers. Mm. And this was, I think I saw it in February in Edinburgh. Mm. It's pitch black at noon. Mm. It's it's a dark, (laughs) dark, granite, sodden place. Mm. And this light, was a fulgence, I don't know what you'd call it, luminescence. Mm. And I, I, just, I was thinking, how can you get that off a two-dimensional plane? Mm. It was awe-inspiring. Mm. And then one more example, a bit more profound, I'd, I'd suggest, is um, when I was at uh, University of Pennsylvania, a gang of us, when we, I was there for the year, term finish, and you get, I think it's called a drive away. Mm-hmm. You get, you don't, get paid, but you get a car that needs transporting Mm. to the other side of the country. So there's five of us in the car and they didn't know at the time I didn't have a driving license. Mm. Still don't. So I was a useful passenger. I was literally a passenger only. But we drove from Philadelphia to Los Angeles Mm. and en route, uh, we stopped off at the North Ridge of the Grand Canyon and it was getting towards dusk. And I'll never forget, there's five of us, three Americans, me and another English guy and the two English people, I don't know, denigrate Americans, but we sat there transfixed. We sat uh, separate to each other Mm. as far away as we could get, just so we could have a solitary experience. Mm. And I've never experienced it is, and I don't know how, what you'd make of it, because what I experienced, it wasn't neurosis, but I experienced my absolute 
uh, the insignificance mm. of me as a person. Do you like that feeling? Well, it, it was so, but it was so extreme. Mm. It actually, you couldn't fixate on it in a negative way. Mm. It just, I was overwhelmed with the sense that there's much bigger fish than you, mate. Mm. And I found that really positive. I it wasn't. That. I love that feeling. Yeah, because you're not <laughs> under any pressure to perform. No. no. It doesn't, no, it doesn't matter, matter what you do because it you, it's a palpable sense. This is the universe. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I love that. And that is, I've got, I could, if you could, if you could bottle that experience, yeah. I just think so many mental health problems would disappear. So that, okay. So exactly that moment, let's hold, let's just hold that moment of you with uh, the Grand Canyon uh, experiencing the thrill of your, uh, thrilling, it's dread. It's horror in a sense, mm. but beyond the dread and the horror is release, is liberation. This is the Kierkegaard point I'm trying this to make. This is the yeah. Kierkegaard point. So, uh, who goes to fight the Minotaur in the maze? Per uh, Theseus. Theseus. Mm. Um, so that is down and into the cave to fight the monster, and then to come out, back to the light with the monster defeated. Mm. That's 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 what you do. So, what you were saying before. Uh, the despair for Kierkegaard, Kierkegaardian despair, Kierkegaardian angst is not a closed loop. It's that's what I think he's saying is that's the doorway. Transcendence doesn't mean avoid negative emotion. You transcend only by going through. You go through the initiatory fire, the pain, the misery, as you say, you're like, because you want to talk about the wonder of misery, the the resistance, the the combat to get back to a sort of courageous state, you on the edge of the Grand Canyon, of looking at the reality that we're, it doesn't matter, we're insignificant. We are going to age, we are going to die. In Instagram, there is no aging, there is no death, there is no sickness. There is only youth, beauty, and uh, an idealistic, idealized, hyper-idealized version of life. It's from the cave. It's from, it's from the cave. You, you want the ideals. And I believe it induces way more real despair than the courageous confrontation, as we said earlier, the exposure therapy of no, go, don't stick in the anxiety. Don't stick in the despair. Transcend. Go through. Yes, we're fucked. That's the truth of life. You said uh, um, Greek philosophy was preparation for death. That's Buddhist philosophy. It's also the circularity. So there's a guy you may have known much more about than I do. Is He's Romanian, Mircea Eliade, I think it's pronounced. Well, he, he wrote a lot and he's, he's got a mixed reputation in the academic community, but he was mm. a prolific writer about mythology. Mm -hmm. And one of his notions was that a mythical time, there's an eternal return. Mm -hmm. It's circular. Right. So th th this would be the Greek idea that we all fight as warriors. Uh, we die, but we have our name. Mm -hmm. Um, and they didn't even have their notion of the afterlife wasn't particularly inspiring. You're a shade right. in Hades when it went into the Roman theology. And so when Virgil describes, you know, um, goes down and describes going down into the underworld, mm. all you see are shades of people that used to be. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, it's a bit shit down here. <laughs> but it's not like, oh, you will find freedom in future. No, that's, yeah. that's your afterlife. Yeah. <laughs> so you make the most of your life, yeah. but then it will be for the next generation and they repeat the process. So, mm. but there was a circularity, which wasn't a bad thing, mm -hmm. but that was, that was mythic time. Mm. Generation after generation, nothing ever changes. We keep going back to Ecclesiastes, don't we? Nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. This is the cycle of, I don't want to sound like Elton John, but this is the, <laughs> the cycle of life. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want a spotlight on me. African chanting ensues. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm sorry to go on a, on a complete tangent, which will be very short. But have you ever seen Modern Family? And there's two gay guys. Yes. And they yeah. have a kid. Yeah, yeah. And they bring the kid into the music from The Lion right. King and rip, put the kid and it's on the foot funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> no, I think, I think there's, th there's, there's real um, substance to, to the idea that the solution to say, if you have a Gen Z kid, depressed, anxious, I know I will sound like a broken record. It's not a psychological solution that they need. It's a philosophical mm -hmm. one. Psychology has nothing for them. Psychology is yin. I can only say to you as a, like a smother mother, my poor baby, you're broken. Does it hurt? Take this, it will hurt less. No, that's not 
They need yang. They you see, need... I've hijacked your Spartan life coaching, though. It's, you know, my the concept of Spartan therapy. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. me in North Wales screaming Kafka at you. <laughs> and that'll knock some sense into them. <laughs> Just screaming Kafka. Can we come to. Um, because uh, you have slides here. Just quickly, you told me to read um, Metamorphosis, and um, I felt uncomfortable. Um, I didn't. I didn't like the main character. I didn't like the people around him. It was. I felt claustrophobic. I felt v- very uncomfortable. And then at the end of it, I didn't know what the hell I just read. I was like, "What does he fancy his?" Sister- my first impression when I read it was, "That's my average weekend." <laughs> I feel uncomfortable. I'm not happy here. And then it ends and I don't know what the hell just happened. To <laughs> what was the point? Nothing, nothing. Um, p- please, please tell me about metamorphosis because I really well, can haven't... I do it back to front at yeah. the very end. Mm. He does it in a lot of um, his stories end in death. Right. But there's a certain poignancy when the beetle bug cockroach, mm. whatever it's, the bug has been interpreted as. Mm. He just lowers, I'd plot spoiler, um, he lowers his head and just mm. expires. Yeah. And I just found it very moving. It was the, and sorry to go off on a tangent, but when you asked me about, um, at the end, another plot spoiler, at the end of Blood Meridian. Yes. Um, before the epilogue, at the very end of the book, or the last few pages, mm. the kid walks into a privy. Mm-hmm. And the judge is sat there, this six foot five albino naked man, mm. uh, completely hairless. Mm. He's naked, sit, gets up off the toilet and embraces him. He gathers him up into his great and terrible flesh. Yeah. And I, I don't know what, what you think, but I actually saw a link there between that and the Kafka ending. I did not see the link. Can but you see it now or do you think I'm talking nonsense? It made me feel the same way. So I, I, I wanted to bring up Blood Meridian anyway, but Blood Meridian to me is 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 kind of... It's not a story in a normal story. It's more like poetry in that the point is to evoke imagery and emotion in you, mm. not to give you a satisfying narrative is the yeah. way I take it. But I see that. As, I, I see Kafka as, um, sorry, I see McCarthy as Kafka in Stetson. Okay. Well, okay, well, okay. so the, the, the horror and the discomfort and the bewilderment was a very similar feeling at the end of yeah. those books. I was like, what, what the hell? What the hell? But then but what you've said is I'm not quite sure now. You've said you you didn't like the Kafka, you didn't enjoy it, mm. but you're admitting the ending was quite similar and you do like the ending. Or sorry, you do like Blood Meridian as a I, book. I, 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 f- I loved Blood Meridian. I didn't like Metamorphosis, but I will admit the feeling at the end Yeah, at the end. But, then you, and you, but you also had your doubts about you didn't know what happened at the end of Blood Meridian. I I love not knowing what's yeah. happened at the end of Blood Meridian. I'm online reading Reddit threads of people who think they've solved it, and I'm like, no, there, it's, there's no solution. The point is, there's no solution. To, yeah, and to this. Well, that's the, the Kafka beauty to me is the the, the only insofar as there is a solution, mm. he's taken the metaphor of what if a traveling salesman. Mm. Is like a bug because mm. if you think about it, a traveling salesman, they're not, it's not a great status job. And you're going having doors shut in your face. You are a pest. You're a pest. You're mm. a cog in the wheel. Mm. Um, so it's the lowest of the low. And also, you're dehumanized in the capitalist system. Mm-hmm. So he's taken that metaphor. What if you wake up feeling like a bug? Mm. And what I love about Kafka is he takes a metaphor. There's a phrase in Marshall McLuhan where he says, a man's grasp should exceed his reach, or what's a metaphor? Okay. <laughs> Which I think is a beautiful quote. <laughs> a you know, get quote. your head around that one. Yeah. But it's what Kafka does. He okay. takes a metaphor. Mm. And it's a bit like me with a story. You don't just tell it. You flog it to death. <laughs> you lift its tail up and you go at it again. Um, <laughs> it's dead, Paul. I don't care. <laughs> I can see life. <laughs> For the love of God, it's dead. I think we've just committed four crimes in Scotland already. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, so, so at the end of Blood Meridian, because I've, I've been thinking about it a lot as I've been emailing you, it ends with, um, I think we never know what happens in the Jakes. We never know what the men see in the privy. But based on their response, I don't think it's... It's a dismembered body. Whatever whatever it is, it's not. So some people are saying it's a dead child. Some people say they actually see the judge sodomizing the kid. I think the point of it is it's some sort of a blasphemy. It's blasphemous. 
whatever it is, it's it's blasphemous, which is why the the guy's response is, oh my good God. And I, I wondered if at the end of, of, of Kafka's book, is there a, is there a blasphemous element there? Because I asked you, it ends with him talking about his sister's lithe, healthy body. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you're obsessed with this. Um, <laughs> there's a part of the show. It's it's like a novella, isn't it? It's yeah. like, is it 50 pages, 60 pages? I, I think it took me, well, it wasn't more than an afternoon to read that. Yeah, whole thing. It's, so it's anyone a, it's who wants to read it, it's not yeah. a massive, it's not like my normal go and read War and Peace. <laughs> 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 no, it, I, one of the aspects of being an insect is he he finally gets a sense of liberation mm. because what I was saying about seeing the Grand Canyon, mm. all this pressure of your social performative self mm. was gone. Mm. When he's an insect, the one upside is he gets to act like a bug, right? which is quite liberating. Yeah. And I think one of the subtexts of the whole story is he isn't in tune with his natural... So we'll talk later about the apple... Apollinean versus the Dionysian. Yeah. Yeah. But it's basically the rational versus the animalistic. Okay. So the whole short story is an extended metaphor of the animal within us. Okay. Not even animal, insect, you know, it's yeah. worse. Yeah. Vermin. The lowest. Yeah. And I think the German, I think it's vermin is the actual impression of the title. Okay. Um, Was he writing in Czech or German? German. I think it's high German. High German. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, th- no, I think he wrote in German, and, mm. but he spoke. I, th- I think, yeah, I think he was a, he was an ethnic Czech living in Germany, speaking and writing in German. Right. And, but he did speak, obviously, some Czech. Mm. Um, so he's he, he's not in touch with his animal nature mm. until this terrible thing happens to him. Mm. And it's interesting when he, um, he starts showing amorous intent as an insect mm. to his sister, but it's when she's playing music. Mm. And this is the Dionysian in, in the Greeks. The whole point of the Dionysian was its intoxication mm. through wine, Bacchus, the god in the Roman Bacchus, mm. Bacchanalian excess. Mm-hmm. But music, so when the Greek did tragedies, there was music. That was the Dionysian element of tragedy. Mm. And the dialogue was the Apo- Apollinian. Mm. So that's... I, because we're talking vaguely around incest, I keep thinking you're going to say Appalachian <laughs> because he kind of fancies his sister. Um ap- Apollonian? No, people say Apo- Apollonian, but I, I seem to remember reading somewhere that, strictly speaking, it's Apollonian. Apollonian, okay, okay. But it's not as easy to say. Apollonian uh, as opposed to Dionysian? Yeah. What's Apollonian? Is that order That's versus the rational. chaos? It tends towards the rational, but it's mm. basically images, dreams, etc. Mm. So in, in the Greek tragedy, the way Nietzsche wrote about it was, in a Greek tragedy, you've got the people performing on stage speaking to each other. That's the dialogue. That's conceptual. Mm. So that's Apollo had this notion of light, the shining God. Mm. So that's the rational, let's talk, let's discuss. The Dionysian, remember they had um, in between these performances of tragedies, the the chorus was giving a running commentary. Mm. But when the play was ended, the chorus would, they were dressed as satyrs, Mm. so goat men. And they had huge The chorus fake. was dressed as satyrs? Well, when they finished, they'd, they'd act as the chorus. Oh, okay. And then the chorus would be the satyrs. Okay. And they'd do a satyr play. Oh. And they had fake... Is that where satire comes from? Yeah. And oh. they have fake uh, fake phalli. They had fake phalli? Yes. Oh, huge, big fake phalli. That sounds like something that I would enjoy watching. <laughs> what would they do with the fake phalli? Well, just jump around. Yeah. <laughs> no, what was that song? Jump around. Jump around. Jump around <laughs> with the fake phalli. So they dance a satyr with... And it was to mock. And this is the, the... But A, it was sexual. Yes. Animalistic. Yes. There's music going on. There's yes. people with massive members jumping around. I know what I was in a past life now. It's all making sense. But this is Nietzsche's point. They had the rational and the animalistic were combined. So so to break the tension of the yeah. tragedy, uh, half men, half horse creatures would run because around. Because it's with, also to make fun of what's preceded. So never ah, get too serious. Don't get too serious. Here's some giant cocks yeah. to cheer you up. Oh, well, seriously. And they would just do a song and a dance well, routine. Yeah, and also and- there's a practical element because when they had a festival, for example, from memory, um, they do f- a performance of three plays in a day. Yeah. And the whole community would judge it. Mm. But imagine three tragedies. Mm. So it was to break up. Mm. And so your mind's refreshed. It's like an amuse-bouche. <laughs> 
Of a bit of <laughs> pardon my friend, a bit of cock dancing. A bit of cock dancing is an amuse bouche. <laughs> and then you'll have the next one. So right. your, your palate is being cleansed by filth. And now more sadness. <laughs> dongs and today do, on dongs and sadness. <laughs> you will die one day, but at least there are giant cocks along the way to the grave. I shouldn't have encouraged you. I knew this was. I knew this was going. I wrong. need very little encouragement. <laughs> Sorry. So I didn't know that. I had no idea because I went to see a very famous British actress, um, Judy Dench, in Liverpool do Medea. And uh, she was brilliant. And I didn't know anything about the play, but she'd made me cry. And I was like, I don't even really know what's mm-hmm. happening. But the intensity with which the emotion she brought forth. But uh, we didn't get a giant cock dance at the no, end. This is I, it. I really could have used one because I found the whole thing very disturbing. <laughs> And that would have cheered me up on my way home. But you're, you've read a lot of Nietzsche, but you need to... Um, I keep nagging you to read Birth of Tragedy. And I Because he yet. discusses, not all of this, but he yeah. discusses elements of this. Right. And I think it's the first major work he wrote, and I think it informs all the rest of his work. Your your point here, just just to keep people on track, is uh, that, that really... I, I mean, think we've lost them. I, I think they're gone. <laughs> there's no one watching Bye-bye. it. Well, I, we could say anything, because there's no one watching now. Um, the, the giant cock sent them off. Um that that you agree with Nietzsche that there is a necessity to tragedy and we need to bring it back. Yeah, and he basically was arguing the decline, he was like Oswald Spengler, you know, the decline of the West, the, yes. all these theories at the time that the West was entering a death spiral, which is mm. quite topical. Mm. He was basically arguing that that's largely the reason. The golden age of Athens mm. was when, in fact, Athens was on a downward slope just as these great tragedies, Euripides, mm. uh, Sophocles, were producing these brilliant tragedies. Right. And in history, it's interesting that, again, there's a phrase from McLuhan where he says, when a plane breaks the sound barrier, mm. you can see disturbance on the wing mm. of air. Mm. And this point is that just as you're leaving one realm mm. behind, mm. you can see it for the first time. Oh. So the idea is that the Sophocles and uh, Euripides and these great tragic uh, writers, mm. at their peak, just before the floor got pulled away from uh, ancient classical culture, uh, you know, Athens hit the skids. Mm. Because just as you're leaving something, so I would, I'm fixated on the 1920s in terms of literature. Mm-hmm. So uh, Ulysses by James Joyce and The Wasteland, the poem by T.S. Eliot. Mm. Some of the greatest works of art in literature, I think, mm. 1920s and 30s, mm. just before it all hell let loose with the Second World War. Well, you insisted on me watching this song and dance routine from Babylon Berlin. Babylon Berlin, amazing which, series. Which reminds me, like it's this peak of... 1939, I think that's it. And this, it's so haunting. Yeah. It's, especially when you know the history, it's like, it's such a strange scene, but they did it so well. Like the the dance routine, which is kind of, it's not slick, it's goofy. And there's something very human about it. Uh, the the woman who's singing, the, the, even the lyrics of the song, the music. The, you know, way- the lyrics in German, the, the, I think the version I asked you to watch didn't have the subtitles. Um because it was the best quality vision. Yes. But it's something like from ashes to dust. Ashes to dust, yeah. It's it, uh, typically Paul, cheery lyrics. Cheery <laughs> lyrics, yeah. yeah. But no, for people um, who don't know what we're talking about, Babylon Berlin is a German produced, it depends what cable you've got, but in Britain it's on Sky TV or now television. And it's a four series. I think they might be making another one. Um, but four series set in starts in 1939, I think, just before the outbreak of the Second World War. And it's Berlin club culture is part of it. But they must have spent a fortune on the cobbled streets, the cars, everything is of its time. And it's what you're saying about the uh, the Berlin cabaret. It's also, the, there are bits of the series that uh, look at uh, the early cinema, German cinema. Mm. And the early German cinema was based upon German expressionist theatre. Mm. And again, by, it looks clunky by our standards, mm. but they were in, they was, it was informed by theatre. And it's ghoulish. And there's a famous film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which if you ever see on YouTube, just snippets. It's a bit like, you know, Bella Lugosi, Nosferatu. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's the aesthetic. Okay. Um, but it's they do it basically with stage sets as if you're in a theatre, mm. and that's how they filmed. But it was also the cameras weren't particularly mobile, mm. so you you know whenever you develop a new art form, you always rely upon the previous art form. 
Mm -hmm. tends to be how it works mm -hmm. until you develop a new grammar. Yeah. So early German uh, cinema was very like German theatre. And that's what Babylon Berlin reminds me of. Do you remember the where in the series people... I think it's the last 10 minutes. It's about 13 minutes from the end. Series one, episode two. It's a dance scene in a club and it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's 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 really haunting. And then, if you want to light relief after you've watched that and had the bejesus skirt out of you, just you find it bizarre. Um, the King of Yodeling is another two-minute segment from series four, which is um, I'll sh I'll send you the link. It's yeah. laugh out loud funny. I'll, I'll put I'll put these links in the in the description. Could you just look up uh, Babylon Berlin dance routine just in case it comes up? If it's uh, because again, it's. It's uh, it's it's done underground. Does this? Well, I sent it to you because we'd been discussing the Dionysian, the, the depths of the human soul, and that's what. And it also shows you the origins of Hitler. Let's let's play fifteen minutes of this. I think we'd get away. It's with only 15. four. Yeah, it's only four and a half minutes. Could you wind it to the halfway point? Can they still hear me as I talk? There's this, str it's so spooky. There's this strange escalating feel, but there's something, they've captured something tragic in all this as well. And this is, um, we've talked about you and I, Rene Girard, of desire. You look at the two men looking at the woman who they yes. would both want to dance with. Yeah. And it's the rivalry is what drives the desire because they, they have a dance competition now. He wins. See, he's... And the other one dives in him. This is me in Liverpool in the late 80s. <laughs> oh, I could throw some shapes. <laughs> Okay, stop there. Stop there. I just wanted to give people enough of a tease that they would bother to go and watch yeah. the whole thing and to listen to the song. I I just it's But it goes I, it shows you how it could have gone two ways because the the singer as people can see is mm -hmm. a woman um obviously dressed as a man but hitlerish the then, way in which she gets response from the audience. So this is the good side of the communal collective effervescence. Yes. This is the Dionysium where everyone's having fun. Yes. There's no implicit violence. Yes. But Hitler used exactly the same energy I read for in the evil. I read in the comments as a character, she's a Russian aristocrat. Yeah, yeah. I think, and I think in reality, she's actually a Lith Lithuanian or something. A, a, a Lithuanian aristocrat. Yeah. No, uh, I think in reality, oh, she's in Lithuanian. Oh, in reality, she's Lithuanian. She's playing okay. a Russian. Oh, okay, okay. The actress yeah. is Lithuanian. So, um... This we got to this point because you were saying there's 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 like a peak of culture before the collapse, and I don't maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but I don't know how they captured that. But it has a collapsing feel to it. It's like we reach for a moment and we could have done something, but in the end, uh, human frailty, greed, lust, mm. ego, the dark, the shadow. No, I think you tell that. Where can where can you go after that? If you watch yeah. the whole thing, it's brilliant. Yeah. But the yeah. question then is. There's a phrase in Jean Baudrillard, just to be mega pretentious, <laughs> where he talks about all of this stuff in the media. Yeah. And he says, it's like, and this, you'll love this. He said, it's like being at an orgy. Right. And then someone, imagine someone smoking a Galois yeah. and someone whispers in French, what are you doing after this? <laughs> Meaning, where'd you go? Yeah, yeah. You've just been in a swing sex swing yes. with five other people. Yes. Would you, would you fancy a cup of tea? Well, it's like, what do you do afterwards? Yeah, I've I've been asked uh, twice now. I was asked recently to 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 one of these events, and I'm like, <laughs> I don't have any interest. It's and, and Richard, would it surprise you to, if I told you I've never been asked? <laughs> have, you, have you not? <laughs> Imagine me with my copy of Sartre in the corner. I love misery. <laughs> do you want to go to Oji? Yes, I will give them more misery. Do you know what Beaujard said about this? But I, I'm sort of like trying, they're, they're, and they're like, but, but why? You know, you're, you're very open-minded. You're very experimental. I'm like, because I'm afraid it's going to be depressing. And like you just said- I can where, guarantee it would be depressing. Where do you, what then? Like, what are, you know, um, to me, it, 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 it's the opposite of eroticism. 
Well, and again, Baudrillard, I'm sorry, but he's massively undervalued Baudrillard. He wrote a book. Um, there was a woman in France called Catherine Millet, mm. and she had a, a, an autobiography that was a massive expose of her own. She was basically a, a pathological nymphomaniac, mm. and she, but she looked like a librarian. Okay. Which, not a particularly a, a sexy librarian, if you ask me. <laughs> More, more like a mousy librarian. And, but that's what made it even more surprising. Right. But she detailed just this mechanistic, insatiable sex mm. life. Mm. And Beaudrillard writes about it and says she is the epitome of this culture because she's reduced sex to machine-like activity. Mm. It's like being on a conveyor belt. Who, the who, notion of seduction yeah. is completely gone. Who 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 was this woman? Sorry, Catherine Millet, M I double L E T. And Please don't search for it because God knows what will come up. <laughs> Be careful with your search results. And and he was writing about her as an he was example. saying she's a she's an example. She's a, a cultural phenomenon that could only exist in a declining culture. I've is I've, your point? Yeah, I've I've actually been with uh, two women like that, and when you describe that woman to male friends in the gym or in the, oh, that's amazing. It should do, there's no boundaries. It's, it's, that sounds like the dream. And I'm like, it's, it's not, it's actually, it actually kind of kills a lot. There's because I, so there's no, there's no game there. There's no dance. There's no seduction. Well, it is. I need you the word seduction. to thrust in me now very hard for a long time. And no, I'm but like, I, I would, <laughs> if people want to get into pretentious French philosophy, Jean Baudrillard actually wrote a book called Seduction. Okay. And it, it, its basic element is people misunderstand it that it's only about sex. Mm. He applies your notion, what you've just said about the loss of seduction mm. to a society wide. Right. So yes, of course, it has a sexual element. So basically the difference between a candle lit dinner, mm. lingerie mm. versus crotchless panties. Oh my God. Which are, it's things. contradiction in terms. Yeah. And pornography. Mm. One has had all the mystique taken away. Yes. It's the difference in eroticism and pornography. Yes. It's a judgment call, but basically eroticism works on the basis of covering things up. Yeah. So a burlesque, I don't think there's any, there's fans going everywhere. Yes. But you never ever, unless I've got this wrong, you very rarely see the woman completely naked. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed you? to. That's, yeah. that's the art of burlesque. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Whereas pornography even if you're involved, I think Baudron makes a point along the lines of even if you're actually involved in the act, mm. you wouldn't see as much as the person watching the pornography can. That's why I claim, um, I don't, you, you probably wouldn't know this, but uh, the the psychological review of uh, pornographic content usage, as you get, as you look at pornographic co content usage and search in younger generations, it's becoming there's more of a fixation on voyeurism and cuckoldry, which I, I, my argument against pornography, I don't argue from a, a moral uh, position because I, I'm not of the belief that there's something uh, intrinsically immoral. As long as everybody's happy and everybody's being paid and it's professional, and everybody's consenting, it's fine. But if you keep watching, you're hardwiring watching this, not doing this into the sexual instinct. And I think that younger generation who have on their phone in their pocket, like 4K stream, and they can watch anything, of course they're going to consume hours of it. I would have done if I was 12, 13, 14 years old. I would never have got any work done. I'd have been up until five in the so morning. That's why they're not reading Kafka. That's why they're not reading Kafka. They're wanking themselves <laughs> blind, which I would have been if I was a, a young kid as well. But then... <laughs> What Sorry, all I can hear is a voice. Where are you, Richard? <laughs> Say that again, lad. Where are you? Um, but then uh, the damage is in the uh, instrum instrumentalization of human beings. I'm really not a Christian conservative. I know this sounds like I am, but it's not a Christian conservative right-wing finger wagon position, but that's a, that's now an object, not a person. And you, you're not, we're not evolved for that. You're not designed for that. And now you are a watcher, not a doer. And I think that's raised the taste for voyeurism and cuckoldry. No, no, no kink shaming. If that's what you're into, that's cool. But I think that's what was caused statistically a large uh, 
tranche of the population to go in that direction is just is but that's also sorry I'm sorry I don't mean to psychoanalyze what you're saying but you mm. said no kink shaming mm. and what I find interesting about that is that's another aspect as a society we've taken away transgression yes so have you have you ever seen the black and white film brief encounter no where it will it's a um it's a very old fashioned, I think 1945. Mm. And it's a bloke and a woman who are always threatening to have an extramarital tryst mm. and they never do. Mm -hmm. But they're in like a step, they always meet at the train station. Mm -hmm. And it's, would you like another cup of tea, darling? Yes, mm. darling. And that's as erotic as it gets. Right. But it was very popular. Zizek talks about it. It was very mm. popular with the gay community because it was of a time when mm. the, what they were doing was transgressive right. in 1945 even though they never did anything. Mm. And there was people in the gay community saying what they used to like about the gay community was things were transgressive. You'd right. have to have furtive encounters. Yes. Whereas now, everything's on grinder. Yes. Everything, and you, when you said uh, no kink shaming, my, my response, my Baudrillardian response would be, why not shame the kinky bastards? Yes. And as, they as would good, probably, they as would good enjoy Catholics, it. As good Catholics, yeah, but also, we know. But, the, but what I'm saying is there's a productive element to shaming yeah, 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 them because yeah, yeah. they we, enjoy it. We'd enjoy it more. So there's stand-up comedians I want to reference here. There's Dylan Moran and he says, an Irish comedian raised as a Catholic, there is uh, two levels of joy in eating the cake when you're on a diet. One is the taste of the cake. And the second joy is the overwhelming guilt and shame that it produces inside <laughs> of you. And uh, Louis C.K. does a bit about how it well, was. He knows about shame. He does. <laughs> poor, poor lad. Poor lad. Um, what it must have so much more fun for gays in the times before now because of this, the, the need for secrecy, the shame, the guilt and, and doing something and then saying, oh, my father's going to hate me if he ever finds out about this versus now, yeah. which is actively openly the celebrated. About, the point about transgressive enjoyment is you have to be transgressing something when all limits are taken away. There's yes. no transgression. Where's it, the fun in that? What are you doing after the orgy? Right. That, that's Baudrillard's point. You're taking away the thing that generates the kinkiness. In modern dating, um, the... I don't want to give too much away about this, but what I found... Uh, so, the the trans... If, if you tell us what you're going to tell us, I'll admit to I'm wearing a basque at the moment. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In modern dating, the transgression is the hug and the kiss and looking at somebody during sex. Yeah. Intimacy is the transgression. Showing up at somebody's house at three, this is based on experience. I'm not make, make, showing up at somebody's house and doing the most graphic things imaginable that previously I would have only ever done after two years of being in a relationship straight away with no questions. That's fine. But if you try to hug afterwards or before or show affection or make eye contact, hey, what are you what are you doing? Which would have been in a in another time, if you tried the transgressive sexual act with somebody who you didn't know, that would have been the hey, what are you doing? To that, I didn't want to be graphic or reveal anything about myself, but it makes sense, I right? Think, yeah, I think yeah. that horse is bolting you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let it go, lad. You're done. You're done for. This is how I get cancelled is by talking to you for too long. I just eventually cancel myself. But that that's the, and I also think that that's why they're depressed. That's why that generation is depressed. What are they? Where's the tension? Where's the fight? Where's the seduction? It's yeah. just sorry to repeat it for the third time, but it's mm. what are you doing after the orgy? It's right. said in a depressed Galois yeah. wine soaked voice. Yeah. It's yeah. a despondency. Yeah. What are you doing afterwards? It's well nothing. What what what's left? The and the the only the only hopefulness would be to to say, you know, and this is a slightly Zizek point, come back to mine and let's talk about films. Yeah, well let's let's go and read Metamorphosis let's, together. <laughs> that's, Seriously. That's the new transgression. <laughs> you disgusting perverts. <laughs> degenerates. Degenerates. So um just uh, I just want to ask you this and we'll move on to the slides. Um I'm overreading this this mention of his sister at yeah, the end I of think Metamorphosis. You, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary. Maybe I'm underreading it. Okay. But that is the beauty. It, it's open to interpretation. And it's what we'll dis discuss in a minute, hopefully, mm -hmm. is the notion of enigma, by definition, is ambiguous. It's Let's, enigmatic. We need, we, and we need that, we need that enigma. Um, what I saw with the discussions of, of, of Blood Meridian online was people really trying to close the loops. Yeah, because they can't deal with it. It's like the end of The Sopranos. Plot spoiler if you haven't seen The Sopranos. <laughs> yeah. I used to do this in when I lectured, you know. Yeah. I'd tell people to go and watch The Sopranos or Breaking Bad mm. and I'd give them a week so they'll have got into like series two or three mm. and then I'd tell them the end of the whole thing mm. in the next lecture. <laughs> and they're like, 
Sorry, it just compensated for the poor pay. <laughs> This but is, anyway, at the end this is of, my only pleasure. At the Sorry, end kids. of the Sopranos, it's mm. I, I loved it. It's mm. a very ambiguous ending. Mm. Mm. Whereas the end of Mad Men, I, if I'd Matthew Weiner is appropriately he's appropriately named, <laughs> was the director. Mm. And can you remember the end of Mad Men? I haven't watched Mad Men. Oh, you really need to. Okay. But there's a really hokey end that actually works in a sense if you if you view it critically. It's a brilliant ending. Mm. And it revolves around the Coca-Cola advert. Mm -hmm. He's basically an ashram. He's trying to find himself. He's had mm -hmm. a traumatic. He's Mister Cool, um, and he's but he's had this. He's basically he's not psychologically okay. Mm -hmm. So he goes off to find himself, and they're all in yoga gear. But mm -hmm. he's still got a a crisp white shirt from memory, right? Um, and they're all humming. And then he starts to imagine the Coca-Cola song, I wish I could teach the world to sing. Right. So he's taken a transcendent moment mm. and turned it into a bloody advert. Seems pretty good. But, no, but that's a brilliant end to the series. Yep. But Math Matthew Weiner, the director, discussed it afterwards in public mm. and saying it was the best advert ever made and it was wonderful. But the tenor of the whole series was, this is the emptiness of modern society and this is mm. one of the ringleaders. Right. So I read it, me being me, this mm. is this is a brilliant end to show how pathologically amoral this guy is. Yes. And he'll even use transcendent feeling to yeah. sell brown fizzy water yeah. that rots your teeth. Yes, yeah. Whereas Matthew Weiner said, oh no, this is wonderful. What's that? <laughs> so it's called the authorial fallacy. Matthew Weiner was too thick to understand the beauty of his own work. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> authorial fallacy. It's called the authorial fallacy, and he's called Matthew Weiner. This so, stuff doesn't make itself. I'm up. gonna I'm gonna write a book that's deliberately ambiguous, sort of Cormac McCarthy ish, and then wait for people to just fill in all the blank spots that I left with brilliant philosophical theories that I have no concept or understanding. But of. you've put your finger on what is. Uh, you know, when you talk about cults and there's mm. three sections, but the pathology is mm. one element. Mm -hmm. The pathology of modern society is not being able to deal with ambiguity or enigmatic entities. That is the pathology. There has to be an answer. Mm. So I've watched all the, the vow, mm. you know, about the Nexium cult mm -hmm. um, preparation for seeing Mark the Vicente. But when there were very well-heeled people mostly who went mm -hmm. to Nexium. Mm -hmm. And I, tell me if I'm, I'm exaggerating, but when they interviewed, because obviously it's a select sample, but quite a few people, they all said, I had a very successful life or relatively successful, mm. but I was missing something. Yeah. None of them ever had the nous, which in the Greek sense, they never had the nous to realise. That's from Gnostic, by the way. Gnostic yeah. is nous. <laughs> life is about the thing that's missing. Yeah. It's not about the idea that you could go to this I was going to say floppy herd guru, but it's a bit close to home. <laughs> well, now we see what you're working towards. But the idea that he would give you the answer. Yeah. Like the answer to Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. Yeah. The point is the answer's not there. Mm. The yumnut has no centre. It's mm. This is the point. This is the depth of the yumnut. No, I, I, and I really... A yumnut's not a yumnut unless it has a hole in the middle. This is how philosophical we're getting. You said, uh, you said there's a dismembered body in the privy. I, that's that's where my mind goes. You, you like arms and legs tacked off. But you know the book I told you to read about this is a, I've forgotten how it's umphaga or I've, it's the Greek word for when in a Dionysian sacrifice they pull yes. either the animal or the baby. Yes, it's they, horrible. Yeah, yeah, they, they tear pull it apart. apart, and that was a regular practice. As well, well, it's it's this is what they don't know. And one of them, oh, it's vaguely... So he's, hu he's hypothesizing it was a regular practice. Yeah, and okay. it's vaguely funny because in the, the definition, it's a bit like Fight Club. You never talk about Fight Club. If, right. if you're in a cult... You don't talk about You don't talk nasty. about the cult. So what they yeah. don't know about is to the extent to which what happened in Greek Dionysian cults mm. actually is, is it um, anthropologist fantasy. Mm. They found sacrificial bones in certain sites, etc. Mm. But basically, they've never really known because no one ever said, because everyone was under instruction, don't say what goes on in the cult. And the, and the hypothesis is that they were killing kids, right? Well, there is a... Um, God, this really is cheering viewers up. But there is... <laughs> if you think about it, the most... When you make a sacrifice to a god, mm. the most valuable thing you have is your firstborn. Yes. So it's in the Bible, Isaac and Abraham. Yes. And we can stop me going down the alley. So I will just mention this one thing. The alley just opened. In the Bible, Abraham and Isaac go up the hill. Mm -hmm. Is it Mount Mora? But apologies if it's not Mount Mora. It's something similar. Um, 
and only Abraham comes down. So read Genesis. Oh, I thought the no, son was let off the hook. And well, they... that's what everyone thinks. And that is, there is... So it's the real Jewish story that no, he'd no, already no. killed his son and then the angel goes, you don't need to. He's like, oh no. No, but, but this is what, I'm, I'm not claiming that there is a small subset of Midrash that, and there are rabbis. And one of the things about Midrashic culture is rabbis used to often take a mad idea and just see how far it would go. Right. But there is this, and just check it out in the Bible, He's not, he's described going up with Isaac, only mm. Abraham comes back. Mm. And the point is in, in that far, in that part of the world, in the Middle East, um, Assyria, Mesopotamia, mm. the sacrifice of, of the firstborn would be a primitive thing. And part of the argument is the Bible was written by early Jewish people as trying to take pagans away well, from they, that type of behavior. They were so, pagans, weren't they? They were yeah. Can Can the Jews are originally Canaanites, which was a polytheistic religion where they did kill but they sacrificed children to Moloch. And this is the point. So this is arguably the Isaac the Abraham and Isaac story has always been interpreted as this is us moving on. You don't need to do that anymore. Mm. But and, you know, you do the Zizek impression. Mm. What if? <laughs> what if the opposite were true? <laughs> exactly. What if that is the remnant of what actually did happen? Right. still there. And the various people who wrote the Bible, you can you can see the hints of what they were writing out. Mm. So that they're, re, uh, they're doing a uh, Peter Mandelson spin on it. Okay. They're now saying, this is the way, this is what God said to this man. When you think, well, the reality probably was he did kill him. Yeah. Okay. Of people of that time, it wouldn't be a stretch to think he did kill him. Yes, yes. Yeah. But now we're reading a book about how bad this is because God is telling you to pursue a different path. Ah, uh, so it's uh, they're sort of rewriting history yeah. to push you in a different direction. And I'm not claiming that is, and that this is the point about enigma. Mm. I'm not claiming that is true. I'm just suggesting it's a poss interesting possibility. How, how much of because um, we're on uh, sacrifice now? How much of Blood Meridian do you think is about? Uh, human sacrifice, as in deliberate, because all the kids who keep going missing in the book. Well, he's called the kid at the end. He's still the kid. But no, but no the, the idea about the the dismemberment of a child. Is he still? Is when, he the man at the end, or is he the kid? He's the kid. Is he still yeah. the kid? Oh, okay. And even if he wasn't, he's called throughout the whole book the, the kid. kid. He's the kid. So yeah. again, I'm. It, it may not be true, but it fits. The kid walks in, mm. is absorbed by this will to power. Mm. The Judge Holden. And then at the very end, he goes back to dancing. The judge. The Dionysian. Mm. The Dion Dionysus was the god of dancing and intoxication. Yes. So he goes and he's the dancing bear. He is the dancing bear. But my point, I, I, I think I said to you in an email that um, we shouldn't forget he's a dancing bear that's made to dance by Cormac McCarthy, who's in charge of the, the organ grinder. Yeah. Yeah, the god, the god of the 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 Yaldabaoth of the novel is present there. He is, and he says he will live forever. Not he will live forever. The judge, we don't know that the judge lives forever. The judge says he is yeah. the favorite. He says he will live forever, which implies yeah, he might get it. No, might, Cormac McCarthy is describing a, a, a psychopath, but a psychopath driven by the will to power. It's a Nietzschean Uberman gone yeah. mad. Yeah. But my, what I'm trying to say is that he, um, you can get, you can suspend your disbelief too much and mm. think of oh, this all powerful Judge Holden's just killed the kid, mm. which fits with this Dionysian sacrifice of a child, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, who's in charge of the judge? It's a novel, mm. lest we forget. Mm. And that's my point about art and literature. Mm -hmm. We can deal with such dark stuff, the dismemberment of children, yada, yada, yada. Mm. But ultimately, it's in the hands of a wordsmith like Cormac McCarthy. Mm. And you are, I wouldn't say you're obsessed, but you love that book. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of I I totally understand why. Mm. A lot of people, I think, would struggle to finish it. That's what people have given me the feedback. They yeah. said I got through two chapters and I just couldn't, I couldn't take it. And I, but and then ironically, from what I know, it's largely based upon historical fact of a roving band of um, oh, bandits being told yeah. to wipe out Indians. Uh, for they were being paid for scalps. Yeah, being paid by the Mexicans and the Americans to commit genocide. And if they showed up with the scalps, they were given gold for scalps, and so they were incentivized to take scalps from whoever they could. And I also think that's one of the reasons, yeah, having lived in America for a while. 
Europeans. I came back from America realizing how European I was. Yes. Me but too. I love America. Yeah. I, I, if, if I wasn't, if I was younger, I'd go and live there. Yeah. In Texas with a shotgun mm. in a compound. I'd I love bet, it. I bet you would. No, I would, seriously. <laughs> but <laughs> there is this psychological, you don't realize how European you are until you've experienced. And it's the old cliche, but because the, the, we're divided by a common language, mm -hmm. because you speak the same basic language, mm. you think everything will be more similar than it would be if yes. you went to Europe. And because we watch their films and their yeah. TV shows. But my, so what I wanted to say was that yeah. what we're, you're, you're describing about Blood Meridian, mm. that violence, mm. it's probably parts of downtown San Francisco at the moment, but mm. that level of violence mm. hasn't been seen on the European, you know, the Second World War and atypical things like that. But the foundation of America, that level of violence seeps through the culture in yeah. ways that yeah, it's yeah. difficult for us to understand. Very difficult. My impression of America, not when I went when I was 21, but when I went back uh, in 2017, I did a tour of the major cities and did uh, uh, seminars there. Uh, this isn't a criticism of America. It's just my honest uh, impression. A, it still felt like an unfolding project that's mm -hmm. unfinished. And B, savagery. And I don't mean that like people were rude or, or anything like that. There's just, it's just, we are quite, Nash as Europeans compared to Americans. They're quite rough and ready still, but you won't see it on TV. You won't see it in film. You have to be there. And I think you have to travel. You need to do the cities. You need to do the towns. You need to get into the countryside. It's pretty rough. It's pretty compared to our coordinates. There is violence here, but it's not. Now, Amer what, so American what you're basically saying is that if anyone's seen the film Deliverance, that's the underbelly Deli of certain parts De of America. Deliverance, The Revenant. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are films out there. No Country for Old Men is a great adaptation. They're making Blood Meridian. It's definitely happening now. Oh, that's a mistake. You think it shouldn't be made into a film? I'm not no. sure whether it should either. I think it might kill it. No, it, well, it just won't be. I guarantee it won't be successful. It, it, can't, it can't Well, sorry, be really. not that it won't be successful box office. I think as an artistic project, it's doomed to failure. So even just last night, I was randomly reading around because as I tell you, I read terrible things at night to disturb my sleep. And I just happened to be reading about people trying to get from, they were trying to get to California from, I don't know, somewhere in the East Coast. They end up getting stuck in the Sierra Nevada and they start eating each other. And then when people <laughs> don't die of natural causes, one of the women, there's a guy writing a diary saying, Elizabeth says she's going to take our Indian tracker and eat him. This is very, he literally writes, this is very distressing. I'm like, fuck, oh, Cronall. That's only the strongest, toughest, most psychopathic people moving west would have made it. Uh, obviously, they're Europeans, but they have to be a certain type of European. Oh, and no, many it's... people died. They just fucking died because there was nothing there but also the savagery and i don't want to go into this woke thing where it was all white people oh no committing if you read about so correct me if i'm wrong i remember reading about how when tribe indian native american tribes would capture each other or white people and you were tortured <laughs> but torturing people was um woman's work I am something of an expert on this subject. <laughs> but the women were tortured by the campfire. Not, not, and, and you should say not all tribes, not all right. tribes, but there were certain tribes who engaged in the practice of, um, what was it called? Caressing, caressing prisoners. And there were different reasons why you would do this. And there were different protocols. And some people wouldn't be caressed. They would be tested first. And if they had the spirit, if they had the spirit, they might replace a member of your tribe who was killed in battle and they would call you by his name or her name. You're now him. You took him mm -hmm. from us. Now you're him. You better start acting like him. <laughs> you learn the language quick um, and other people would simply be caressed to death. Um, the women were used for torture, particularly of uh, genitalia. Uh, you using sharpened shells, uh, bits of bark that they would insert into you and then set on fire. And the key was to keep the captive alive because it was the evening's entertainment. It, you could expect to be kept alive for five or six days before being caressed to death. While we're on this topic, just one quick example. <laughs> um, I've forgotten the Latin phrase. It's something like scarfus or something. But oh God, <laughs> we're really going no, for you it heard now. About them? Yeah, go yeah. on. No, no, for people, it's just where you, they'd hollow out a log, put you in the log, wipe you with honey. Is that, this is a Persian execution, isn't it? I think the Romans borrowed it. Yeah, ah, they learned yeah, it. Yeah, you put yeah. the log back on and just let the ants. Um, you put you put them oh, in. Oh, you force feed them as you well. You force feed them honey, and you put them in a swamp. 
you put them in swampy, uh, shallow water. And as they, uh, it's, the honey is put on the body and then curdled milk is force fed into them so that they repeatedly diarrhea themselves. Yeah. And what you're, this is the so flies, gross. The flies you're, do their work. You're hoping for the flies to set uh, larvae into yeah. the skin. So you're eating from the inside. It's just Which wild. reminds me, are we going for lunch soon? <laughs> yeah, we are. We're going to have, uh, we're actually going to eat Persian. There's a great Persian restaurant here. Yeah, they're really, really friendly there. We're going to have Iranian I'm lion I'm going to have honey lamb. on mine. Oh, have honey and some extra larvae, please. Um, yeah, no, there is, uh, it's, it, and he covers that. I mean, he covers, Cormac McCarthy in the prologue says, um, people who were looking at the excavated sites showed that there were scalpings going back. My God, 12,000 years in America, scalping wasn't. Because there was this myth that the whites created mm. scalping. No, 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 it was, it was being practiced long before before we came along. It's it's tremendously, I don't know why I love the book. I really don't know why I love it. So apart from the fact he writes so well. So there's these endlessly long sentences with no grammar in them that are just it's beautifully written. You see, well, this is, like, this is how degenerate I am. I read, it, it took me quite a while. Don't, please don't laugh at me. But when mm. I first read it, mm. it actually took me a while to realize I was reading about violence. I was so took up in the language. Yes. Because it's, to it's me, protective. what's it actually, yeah, to some extent for me, whenever I read a book, what's happening in a novel is completely subordinate to the way they use language. Yes. So yes. I wasn't, it was, I was about five chapters in when I thought, oh, people are being killed here. Well, they, uh, I read the, the critical reviews and they said the kid is 15 and he, sh uh, this isn't a spoiler, it happens very early. He shot twice, once in under his heart, once, and I was like, was he? And then he beats a man to death. Oh, did he? I went back and I was like, oh yeah. But I'm so lo like you, I'm so lost. In the well, I also think it's the um, the environment, the way he describes it. And it's sort of a bad, um, different genre, but mm. Breaking Bad, mm -hmm. one of the reasons I think that is such brilliant television is it's the Arizona, New Mexico desert yes. is one of the characters. Yes. And like Cormac McCarthy, yeah. the environment, the, the, the border with Mexico, that borderland, Yes. Is a character yeah. in its own right. Yeah, it is. And I just think when an author gets that right and makes the whole environment a character, it adds a depth to the whole thing. I avoided watching that show for years. I've actually only watched it fully uh, two months ago. And I was shocked by how dark it got. I was I was like, I don't know. If, ever, if this is popular, it's going to be surface level crap. Some uh, middle-aged American guy's fantasy of being a gangster, blah, blah. Who, no, 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 no. This is really dark it stayed true to itself and it was courageous as well like they really leaned in except my own I won't, I won't give away the ending but Better Call Saul which is a mm, sequel off. prequel mm, whatever mm, mm. Um, it let itself down because it, I think it had a bit of a moralistic ending the whole thing was moralistic. I, I actually watched... None of the end of Breaking Bad. Surely when he's he's basically given himself no, over to his no, obsession. No, 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 sorry. Uh, the, uh, the whole of, of uh, Better Call Saul is... So I watched Better Call Saul first. So I had this idea mm. of who Saul Goodman was. And he's a way more morally active character. And then when you go back and watch Breaking Bad, he is an unremitting criminal fucking scumbag. And I was like, why have they... Obviously, time has gone by and culture's changed. And I wondered if maybe a bit of woke ideology had crept yeah, in. Yeah, I think so. Because th there is something that Breaking Bad is, feels like it's from another time. And it feels, it's very courageous. It's 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 harsh. Better Call Saul actually leans out of a lot of stuff that it, that it, it's, frankly, Saul Goodman's not, that's not the same Saul well, Goodman. I promise I won't say a word about what's in it, but I, I recommend to viewers, um, there's a very under-recognized, in my opinion, uh, Australian series called Mr. In Between. I've seen clips, yeah. And I don't know, it's on FX in the UK and uh, Disney Plus. Mm. I don't know in America, FX is a channel there, I think. Mm. But Mr. In Between, there's a series in America called Barry, which is about a serial killer mm. who wants to be an actor and it's played for laughs. Mm -hmm. And I quite enjoyed the first couple of episodes and then I thought it's too camp and... Mm. And this is Mr. In Between is what Barry should have been. Right. But it's it's Australian, I'm, I'm, without judging American taste, it, I love it also because it's so low-key mm. and Australian humour mm. that I think a lot of Americans might watch two or three episodes and not realise there's been about 25 jokes. Right. Which is what, as a British person, we like understated humour. Yes, but Australians in, are great for in that. In terms of story arc, 
And the very final scene, I won't say what it is, mm. the very final scene of Mr. In Between. Mm. I just think the guy, and the guy apparently, the main actor, um, wrote it as well. Oh, wow. Which is unusual. Mm. And why I mentioned it was fresh on my mind because loads of neighbours and people recommended to me to watch uh, Gen Mr. Gentleman on Netflix. It's awful. It's, um, who's the guy who married Madonna for a while? Um, yeah. Guy Richie, it's one of his... Oh, oh, the Gentleman series, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I just can't stand it. Yeah, it's it's not uh, it's not Guy Ritchie's best work. It's a little bit, it's light. But the it's number of people who've recommended it and said is absolutely amazing. It's like one dimensional. You don't, you know, someone gets killed and I'm like, yeah, well, they deserved it. It's just there's yeah, yeah. nothing. It gets it gets worse. The the killings get less and less consequential the further you go, and it by the end it feels. Sometimes he writes like a lazy schoolboy. I think he just got bored of the project and wanted to close it yeah. off. And pieces of the script that you think is um, a, di a direction between script writers as a note actually creeps into the dialogue. And I'm like, guys, this is not meta and clever. This is just lazy. It's really Yeah, may maybe, but I'm so down on it because I watched it immediately after Mr. In Between. And the contrast was too much. It's, there's not much there. No. There's no, there's re it's really... It's, Even the cardboard cut out Scouse characters. They're probably the most interesting thing yeah. that happens and then they disappear. They dis they're, they're, they're not around. It, I love Guy Ritchie's perception of Scousers though. Like his, his, he, he, was gonna, he tried to make a series here back when I used to do door work and they're recruiting doormen as, uh, as extras for it and, and they, they bend the project. They couldn't deal with Scousers. <laughs> well, the, the, the locals were like trying to get in on the film, trying to tax him for money, a uh, pain in the ass. Um, we have less than an hour left to go through. I knew this had happened. Um... 40 minutes to go through these here slides. Right, so we've got 40 minutes. Yes, sir. Right. Are you ready? Yeah. That was our preamble, ladies and gents. <laughs> we just had stuff to get off our chest. <laughs> right, well, this is what we're going to end up with. So I'll race through these, but this <laughs> is um, the bar at the Folie Berger. So if viewers could have a look at that and just get an orientation as to their initial, um, what they make of it. Um, it's because it, Mane, what was associated with the Impressionists, but he wasn't actually, they argue about it, but I don't think technically he was an Impressionist. But Impressionist art like this tends to get used on biscuit tins, um, kitchen aprons. It's it's quite tame in some ways. Mm. So by the end of this little spiel, I hope you'll see it in a completely different way. Got the next one, please. So this is from, we mentioned Kierkegaard before, but he, he wrote this very odd, um, it's from a collection called Either Or. And the point of the book is that you can either have an ethical life or you can have an aesthetic life. Mm. And Kierkegaard does this weird thing where he distances himself from his work with pseudonyms. Mm. So there's at least two or three people writing in either or who get names. Okay. Uh, and I think in one of his works, there's someone called Hilarious, Hilarious Bookbinder. He makes up ridiculous names. That's interesting. But this is the seducer character. I think he's called Johan or something. Um, so do you want to read it? Okay. As yet, she has not seen me. I am standing at the other end of the counter, far off by myself. There is a mirror on the opposite wall. She is not contemplating it, but the mirror is contemplating her. How faithfully it has caught her image, like a humble slave who shows his devotion by his faithfulness, a slave for whom she certainly has significance, but who has no significance for her, who indeed dares to capture her, but not to hold her. Well, the next one, please. Unhappy mirror, which assuredly can grasp her image, but not her. Unhappy mirror, which cannot secretly hide her image in itself, hide it from the whole world, but can only disclose it to others as it now does to me. What torture if a human being were fashioned that way. And yet they're not, and yet are there not many people who are like that? who possess nothing except at the moment when they are showing it to others, who merely grasp the surface, not the essence, lose everything when this is going to show itself, just as this mirror would lose her image if she were to disclose her heart to it by a single breath. And if a person were unable to possess an image in recollection at the very moment of presence, he must ever wish to be at a distance from beauty, not so close that the mortal eyes cannot see the beauty of that which he holds in his embrace and which the external eyes have lost, which he, 
to be sure, can regain for the external vision by distancing himself from it, but which he can, in fact, have before the eye of his soul when he cannot see the object because it is too close to him when lips are clinging to lips. How beautiful she is, poor mirror. It must be tormenting. It is good that you do not know jealousy. And that was written by a double double click to edit. Du- double click to edit was an amazing <laughs> writer. So. Yeah, I preferred his later work. Yeah, he, d- he did get better with time. <laughs> double click to edit. Right, so what I'd say about, I'll, I'll go through this quickly, but mm. um, I'm hoping viewers, it's diff- this Kierkegaard is difficult, but what he's describing is a someone, um, the character has followed a 17-year-old into a shop. Mm. And he sees her in the mirror. But to me, it represents everything about the Instagram culture we live in. Mm. But what he's trying to do is actually, as you follow the, the diary, he's trying not to consummate the relationship. Right. He he pursues. So he, he's basically an aesthetic stalker. Mm. And what, how he's describing the mirror, it's about, it's it's in, we'll see in a second, the, the uh, painting of Narcissus by Caravaggio. Mm. But that the whole point of that painting is Narcissus's fate is so difficult because he's so close to what he wants, mm. too close. Mm. And in Ovid's, I think it's line 465 um, of the Metamorphoses, Narcissus, Narcissus says, uh, all, all I desire I have, and then he says, all I desire I have, my wealth has led me to poverty. Mm. Or something like that. And what mm. he means is he's too close to the object of his desire. Mm. And that's what that excerpt was saying, that there's something about mirrors and distance mm. providing an aesthetic. You can It's what you were saying before about desire mm. and the seduction and the intimacy. There's this terrible dynamic between too close, too much intimacy, mechanical sex yeah. versus too much distance voyeurism. Yes. And there's this incredibly complex relationship getting the balance just right. Yes. And that's our society's lost that balance. That's really interesting. So I've just used the word balance, which segues much more neatly than I intended. So <laughs> this is a picture from uh, Hitchcock's film Vertigo. Mm-hmm. And this is the opening overture where he was obsessed with spirals is a theme, a visual symbol that runs throughout the film mm. in various ways. And the eye sums up. You want to talk about, we were talking before earlier about um, enigma mm. and ambiguity, the human eye. Mm. So you're looking at me now with contempt, but all your eye is, is this. <laughs> I'm looking at you with love. You have only seen contempt. Go on. <laughs> you know what I mean? This, this aqueous globe yeah. can yet express emotion. Yes. If you think about it objectively, that is truly bizarre. Yes. Um, so th- th- that just, I think, right from the get-go of the film, but it's about the vertigo of desire. Mm. Vertigo is physically disorientating. Mm. Next, please. And this is what you're talking about. I think this matches the Diary of the Seducer brilliantly. In this scene, I won't give you the whole plot of Vertigo, but basically he's been set up. This Kim Novak character... Mm has been, he thinks he's following her, but it's all been planned unbeknownst to him. But she's gone into a flower shop and this is him looking at her. But what I think is beautiful is he's looking this way, but we can see her reflection. Right. So that this play on mirrors, and could you show the next one, please? There should be a video clip. I actually I actually was looking at her so intently, I only saw his creepy eye yeah. through the door when you said he's looking at her. Yeah. I was like, who, who's he? And it might have been helped by the fact that Hitchcock was a creepy stalker himself.
That's great, thanks. Now this is again, so I'm just developing this notion. It's it's for anyone who loves film, this isn't this aren't novel ideas, but there is a flower in shot again. This is she's in a restaurant and I would pay to get this wallpaper. Mm. I'd have my whole house done in this. <laughs> Seriously, that is like six inches thick. Yeah. Um, yeah. but he's at a bar, and what's interesting is he looks at her sideways when she first comes through. You'll see it in a second. But actually, it's, it's what's a Hitchcockian impossible shot. Mm. Because when she goes past him, as you'll see, mm. he can't see, won't be able to see her. Right. Because he's, he's trying not to be seen. Right. So this is Hitchcock showing you his mind's eye. Mm. And another great Hitchcock shot is in the birds, when the birds are flying. Mm. And then the camera pans above the birds, and you're looking at the birds. Mm. Which begs the question, well, is this a really big bird? Yeah. Or is this a, this is a God's eye view? Right. Which Hitchcock does that so cleverly, you don't yeah. realize it's happening. Yeah. You're seeing higher than the birds themselves, mm -hmm. which is just brilliant. Uh, next, please. I think this is the, this is the very quick scene. That's great, thanks. But you're saying that, you see what I'm saying about that couldn't have been a shot that he could have seen. Yes, and yeah. then at the very end, she leaves it in front of a mirror. Yes, yes. Because that's basically his projection of how he's seeing her. I've never watched the Hitchcock film. Oh, I did watch The Birds when I was a kid. No, I'm going to force I'm going to force you to watch Rear Window. Well, I, I will do now because I realise watching these few shots, this man is a pervert. And so I'm going to watch his stuff. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I am Rear Window. We need to talk about Rear, Rear Window. Window. Okay, I'll watch, I'll watch it. It sounds like the title of a novel. <laughs> This is what I'm arguing is, which we talked about this in a previous video yes. that we told, we called Narcissistic Social Disorder. That's yes. on the Grannon and Friends, isn't it, I think? Uh, possibly, or on the or philosophy. Or on the philosophy. Channel. It's on one yeah. of them. But yeah. if you want a full discussion of this, I don't want to repeat myself. But it's the big phallic knee is one thing mm. in the middle. But it's the circularity and it's the receding. This is uh, Caravaggio's Narcissus. Mm. And it's the receding, I just think it's a brilliant visual emblem of Instagram culture. That it's, you're only looking at yourself, really. You're looking at a pale shade, as the Romans would have said, in Hades. I didn't notice until we did, uh, for those who haven't seen the YouTube video, if you look at the um, mirror image, uh, Paul pointed out, he's not looking too healthy in that mirror image. He looks ill, diseased, and, and dilapidated. Which, you know, we're all, we're all we're basically looking at in Instagram as reflections of ourselves, even mm. when we're not looking at ourselves. Mm. But anyway, so that's, that's, if you keep that in your mind's eye, that is Caravaggio's Instagram painting, I'd call it. Next one, please. This was just to show you, I won't dwell on this at all, this is very famous, the betrothal at Arnolfini, or the marriage of Arnolfini. Um... And it's just to show you the skill with which, this was 1424, I think. But if you look at the next one, please, that's the mirror at the back of the painting. Amazing. It's a convex mirror. So you can see the back of the people that we saw, and that's the people taking the signature. So uh, we, so the painting is of the woman in blue's perspective? Yes. Presumably, yeah. 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 
So there'll be, I think there'll be, I think it's actually a man. It'll be oh, okay. local dignitaries taking ah. the engagement signature. That's a, that's a very high, in terms of technology and yeah. artistry, that's very high tech. Well, but I'm there. only showing this to show that, um, because if we talk about maybe some smart ass on the internet's going, why didn't you do the marriage at Arnold Feeney? So there it is <laughs> for my imaginary smart ass who's already annoyed me. Yeah. <laughs> Preemptive annoyance from internet comments. <laughs> but just to show the skill. Yes. Um, yeah. Anyway, next one, please. This, I think, is an absolutely amazing um, summary from 1958. It's a short story by a brilliant not, um, short story writer. He didn't, I don't think he did any novel, maybe one. The Adventure of a Photographer, L'Aventura di Photographer, I think it's in it, Italy, Italian. So he says, the minute you start saying something, ah, how beautiful, we must photograph it. You are already close to the view of the person who thinks that everything that is not photographed is lost, as if it had never existed, and that therefore, in order to really live, you must photograph as much as you can. And to photograph as much as you can, you must either live in the most photographable way possible, or else consider photographable every moment of your life. The first course leads to stupidity, the second to madness. Now, if that's not a motto for Instagram... I will post that on Instagram today. I can't uh, believe I've never seen it. And 1958. It's brilliant. And how is that not predictive of the future? Completely predictive. So these, these problems that we say are modern problems, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's just happened since the birth of social media circa 2002. It's a problem that's been in their pipes for a and while. My, my frustration, because I love being frustrated, is that if you know anything about this stuff, you mm. can see this is 1958. Yeah, McLuhan talks about how artists recognize sense ratios and mm. how they change mm. through technology better than anyone. Mm. So this is my constant point about people can't deal with the social consequences of social media because they don't truly understand the problem because right. they don't know about this stuff. Yeah. And it's because you don't read, because you're always on social media, you'll never find out about this stuff. Yes. Ironically, yes. people will find out about this, though, because they're watching YouTube. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if, we, if we didn't put them all off with the dancing Next cocks one, before. Please. But this is just to show you how... Because um, I've, I've talked before about the notion of perspective, visual perspective, mm -hmm. and I just assume everyone knows what it is. Yeah. But this is the baptistery of, in Florence. So that is... That's its geometric, mathematical. If you were going to draw it, you'd need to know that. Mm -hmm. Next, please. And this is how Filippo Brunelleschi, mm. he, um, perspective was known in classical times. So the Parthenon, I think, they they built it so it looked from, a, I think some of the columns are bowed slightly. Mm. So that you, from a distance, it looks, everything looks straight. Right. And I think Euclid, which always makes me laugh, Euclid, it sounds scout, Euclid. Yeah. Um, but Euclid had a notion of geometry. Yeah. The perspective was knowable. So there are Roman frescoes, mm. I think, where there's basic. And even the cave paintings, some of the aurochs or the bulls mm. had uh, their foreshortening, their mm. front was done in perspective. Really? Very basic perspective, yeah. Okay. But they showed a, a knowledge of depth. Yeah, yeah. But this is him, and you can see there was a mirror at the top, um, polished. So he's looking through a mirror. So mm. the idea is he got the real building to superimpose itself on his drawing. So oh, they match wow. perfectly. Wow, wow, wow. So this is him playing around. And when, when would this have been? This was a guy, I think it was a guy called Alberti, wrote a book based upon Brunelleschi's experiments in 1435. Amazing. I think it was. Yeah. But this is just, and this was a rediscovery of what happened in classical times. Mm -hmm. Next, please. So we've also, um, I think it's the second part of narcissistic social disorder. We briefly discussed this. Yeah. But you, when we first discussed this, I, because I'd read about it in advance, mm -hmm. I, you mentioned the mirror at the back mm -hmm. and you initially said, um, some type of painting, I think. Mm -hmm. You didn't immediately recognise it as a mirror. No. And if I'm honest, my initial impression was, silly bugger, that's a mirror. <laughs> when actually I'm more, you know, you've learned as you've yeah. thought about things. Yeah. That isn't obviously as obviously a mirror as I first thought. Right. I think it is. Yeah. But I was very dismissive. Of course it's a mirror. Yes. And one of the reasons apparently they know or they think they know it's a mirror is because... The queen is on the left of the... Um... 
sorry, the queen in the actual painting, we, as we look at it, the queen is on the left. Right. But it, the court protocol said the queen, the queen had to be on the left. But in, in, if that was, if you were actually stood where they were, she'd be on his right hand side. The the other indication that it's a mirror is the way uh, they it's been lit. A, a painting wouldn't light up like that. You see the the way the top left and the bottom right has that yeah, light well, shading. That's it, what it makes you think. Except it couldn't, it couldn't. My counter argument would be the light coming in from the side. There's a casement and there's light coming in at the side. So perhaps. So it could be a painting. Well, I, like I said, I don't think it is. But no, the point I, is, it's about the ambiguity. Yes. Yes. And. It, all of these people looking and us looking and who's in the mirror, where are the people reflected in the mirror? Yeah. It's the emphasis I'm trying to make is this is very automatically ambiguous. Mm. And at the top two, you can see there are dark paintings. Yes. They're actually by Rubens and they refer to scenes from Ovid's Metamorphoses. Really? Because they've been identified because okay. this was a real uh, in the palace. In Madrid. Okay, this is a this is a an image of a real room. Yeah, so okay. they know what was in there because Velázquez, the painter, who was also the guy shown here painting, mm. he was in charge of art collections. Right. But it isn't it interesting. You deliberately you can't see what's in the painting. Yes. But it, don't you see how that's like a meta commentary by Velázquez? Yes. You can't see what's in those paintings. Yes. Just like. You can't be completely sure of what you're seeing in that painting. Right. It's a commentary upon the act of painting. Yes, yes. Multiple layers of, yeah. of ambiguity. Next, please. And that's just to show you how... Yeah, that helps. So king and queen. K and Q is king and queen, right? So, well, the M, the middle one is the king and queen if they were stood to be reflected directly in the mirror. That's where they'd need to stand. Yes. The king and queen number one is actually where we, the viewer, also. Yes. It's what, where the painter is looking. And number two is what's behind the easel. If they were directly behind in a straight line is reflected from the mirror. Yes. But that just shows you the complexity. So, so the green lines are to show it can only be king and queen number, uh, not numbered, M, can only be where they're actually standing. Strictly speaking, yeah, for the mirror yeah. reflection. Yes, yes. But now what's interesting is King and Queen 1, can you see the straight line that goes through the stairs? Yes. That is the actual technical disappearing point of the, the whole painting. Yes. So we are at King and Queen number one. The King yeah. and Queen are at M. Yeah. And could you go back to the previous picture, please? Now, do you see the guy in the background? What's ironic is he's probably the least commented upon figure in the painting. Oh. And in, in real life, he was called Jose Nieto. Mm -hmm. He was a courtier. Mm -hmm. But there's a beautiful book called Everything is Happening by a guy, I think he was called Michael Jacobs, who was dying as he wrote it. And a journalist, Ed Vulliamy, uh, finished it off for him. Mm. But he was obsessed by Las Meninas, this painting, mm. as was Picasso, who did 57, I think it was, variations <laughs> of the same of this painting really? in different ways. He was obsessed by it. And I think a German critic once said, Las Meninas is a painting. Um, no other painting will make us forget Las Meninas. In other words, it'll never be beaten. But you, you see that line that went through the back door that we've just seen? Yes. So they've always said, you know, is he coming in? Is he going out? Mm. That Jose Nieto, um, the author of Everything Is Happening, said that um, he did some research and part of his family name back in his relations mm. was Balazquez. Ah. So one reading of it is, it's just a reading, mm. is that that is actually symbolic. And this was, it was painted by Balazquez in 16... Was it 1676, I think it was? And he died four years later. Mm -hmm. So it's quite poignant. Mm. And I would I would suggest that's like um, this, where's he going? Right. What is that? Mm. And if you accept that's Velasquez, because yes, he's obviously the painter, but is that him going off into the yonder? Based on his body stance, I would have thought that would be somebody who was leaving the room and turns back for one last look. Yeah, 
but you, you wouldn't say, you don't enter a room like that you leave a room like that but he's looking at us so he's just taking one last look before he leaves and you know we were talking about earlier about transcendence and mm. the notion of beyond i'd mm. say that's him like uh, is it charon the in the underworld yeah. river sticks taking yeah. you across to me he's he's represented that's death and it's very light behind him there is he's moving towards yeah, the light he's moving towards the light which mm. is the last thing people say just as they're dying mm. As they've had that fit the yum nut they shouldn't have. <laughs> um, next, please. And, and again, please. So this was what we were... I think this summarises what we were discussing earlier. Oh, it's uh, actually written Apollinian. Yeah. Okay, okay. Unless I've made an error, but I think that's how it should be okay. spelled. I've probably got it wrong. <laughs> so art approaches as savouring sorceress, expert at healing. She alone knows how to turn these nauseous thoughts about the horror or absurdity of existence into notions with which one can live. These are the sublime as the artistic taming of the horrible and the comic as the artistic discharge of the nausea of absurdity. So he's basically saying what art does is help you confront life, which is what we were talking about. Yeah. I just think this summarizes it beautifully. Yes, yes. Um, so would that be, would this perspective of art as a saving sorceress that helps you deal with the horror of life is that Apollinian or Dionysian? It's the mix. It's both. It's a balance. It's the fact what Nietzsche's saying is that the ancient Greeks had it, that balance, and we've lost it. Mm. We are just image-based now. With no awe, we're total bacchanalian excess. That's all we have is image and bacchanalian excess. But separate. So you go out and get legless, do drugs, drink yourself silly, or you watch constant imagery. Yes. But the idea that you relate to reality and your impending death via a complex combination of the comic and the absurd and the tragic yeah. and fate and death, yeah. they were the Greek tragedies. Because, you know, I was saying before, like I was, I was faced with a set of problems and I was inside the house. I was in Yen and it made me quite anxious and I didn't really know how to deal with it. Then I was outside the house driving and I went into Yang. There is a uh, real sort of optimism here that you can change your perspective through art and that which seemed overwhelming and unlivable with can become comical. Well, more than that, I don't think you have to overcome it. You know, the this is this is weird. You know, the embrace of Judge Holden. Go on. I no, wanted, to talk, what, that is I wanted art. to talk to you about the, the no, embrace that's, of that's Judge Holden. That's, well, that's what I think. The saving sorceress mm. is Judge Holden hugging you. Mm. You're the kid, you're mm. being hugged and going into oblivion, mm. but it's being written by Cormac McCarthy. Right. So I, I think it's my reading is that the end of that when he's hugged, mm. it's like the end of me me Metamorphosis Kafka. The head of the, the bug finally gives in and goes, oh, I'm dying. Mm. I thought it was poignant, but quite bizarrely life-affirming. Mm. We all have our ends, we meet it, dead. Yeah. Now, knowing that that's going to happen, I find that more helpful than pretending it's never going to happen. Yes. And it's, Judge Holden is such a terrible figure, mm. but I don't think it's coincidentally, he's embracing the kid. Yeah. It's this bizarre, weird juxtaposition of this evil, weird albino, mm. and almost this motherly embrace. Well, the, the speech that Judge Holden uh, gives the kid in the bar before they have their final meeting in, in the Jakes in the privy. Um, he is with his bizarre, uh, sadistic, uh, archontic philosophy trying to save the kid. He's appealing to him. He's saying to him, you, you, you've held on to your, um, I don't know, uh, Nietzschean slave morality instead of fully committing to the master morality. You held on to your cheap this cheap version of morality where the kid uh, earlier on in the story has the opportunity, but this is not really a plot spoiler, he's ordered to kill one of the men who can't move on. And by failing to kill him, because he doesn't have the strength to take that man's life, he delivers him into the hands of people who then torture that man to death, we presume, because they are torturers we see elsewhere in the novel, because other men who fell into their hands were it's described awfully like we, we don't we don't see the torture as the reader but we see the after effects of it so his weak half committed morality uh, fell below the level of the judge's uh, standards the judge judged him it was below standard he didn't commit to war properly where every other man in the party did and he was he's argue, he's it's like a it, it's like the he's 
trying to convert him. It's like a, he's proselytizing in a certain Yeah, sense. but I think the mistake would be to judge the book. And I don't think it's a coincidence the judge is called the judge. Mm. I would suggest don't judge the book through the judge's eyes. No, we're not supposed to. Yeah, and what I'm saying is what you're describing, the way the judge is telling him what he's done wrong, he's been a, basically a failed Nietzschean slave mor mm. moralist. Mm. That's not McCarthy's message is. And I think there is something um, sacrificial, like at the end, the kid is redeemed by accepting his faith. Yes. So yes, this is what we've been talking about in the Greek tragic sense. Mm. The kid has met his end, mm. but now all this suffering's over. Yes. And this life force, this evil, but it's almost like he goes to the privy almost. I don't know because I don't think he knows it's going to happen. But his last act on earth is to refuse to be cowed by the judge. Yeah. So it's, an, it's a life affirming. This is what the Greek tragedies were about. Mm. It's life affirmation in the face of death. Remember what I said at the very beginning, philosophy is about preparation for death. Uh, and he does, he also, my reading of it was that he also has to accept that he was part of it. He was, he, he mm. tried to be morally beyond it and an observer. And many people have commented when I read the criticisms that he disappears from the narrative because I think Cormac McCarthy wants us to understand like he, he's there, but he doesn't want to be there. And yet he was there and he did remain with the gang and he had the opportunity to kill the, the judge. And we know he's a good shot, but he can't do it. He do, he's not capable. And even, is it the priest or Tobin is saying to him, kill him, you'll never have this opportunity. They only have one round left with these weird rifle loaded uh, pistols, these huge pistols they're carrying. Um, and he has the opportunity and he can't bring himself to do it because he half asses it. And I think there's an acceptance from him. Like, uh, yeah, I was... I, that in, even though the judge is a lunatic and a psychopath and a serial killer, probably a serial killer and, and a pedophile, it's probably him who's killing these children, he still sees there's some logic there. And yes, he doesn't run. He doesn't run. He doesn't fight. And the judge is all about certainty. The judge is about knowing what the answer is. Mm. Keith Ranieri. Yeah. The, the judge of the cult. Is, has got the answer to everything. Yeah. And I think the kid represents Cormac McCarthy's position. In art is, is enigma. In art is ambiguity. Mm. Life is vague. Mm. Maybe he should have shot that guy, but then that was against his values. And mm. technically that's a mistake, but life's not, there isn't, it's not the answers to an equation. Yeah. And that's the mistake of this society that everything has to have a codified answer. Yes. The people who fell into the Nexium trap are already prepared to think there's a formulaic answer to life. Yes. Otherwise, Ranieri's an idiot with a flip chart. <laughs> yes, that's true. It is. It, yeah. it makes from an artistic sense. He was a joke. Yes. Yeah. But my theory is, immersed in this type of stuff, you couldn't take Keith Ranieri seriously. I'd be at the back of the, with my sash on, mm. shouting, have you read Nietzsche? <laughs> and it wouldn't work. I'd be kicked out. Yeah. Yeah, you'd go. Yeah. yeah. So I think this offers some prophylactic protection. Yes. Yeah. And but as 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 we said in the beginning, part of the point is that there is no point and you have to wrestle with the ambiguity. You have to wrestle with the nuance. You have to accept the discomfort. And yes, you don't you don't know. You're not actually being offered a solution. What Cormac McCarthy is presenting in Blood Meridian uh, is a big well, it's a big series of questions. Mm. And why do you even want to wrestle with them? Because there's this intuitive sense there's something very important there, but it's hard to put your finger on well, exactly Martin, what Martin it is. Well, Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher, said questioning is the piety of thought. Mm. And that was his answer was philosophy is preparation for death, but it's constant questioning at Zizek's point. Yeah. It's not about answers. Yes. A lot of modern analytical philosophy is trying to provide logical, analytical formulae mm. that are self evidently true within their own terms. Maybe, actually, you've got me thinking now, maybe the, the other criticism uh, of the judge by the god of the book, Cormac McCarthy, is this guy thinks he has all the answers. And, and he, what does he do? He kills. Mm. His certainty does nothing but kill. Every ancient artifact he finds, he makes a beautiful drawing of, and then he stamps on it and destroys it. And he's, he's irritated by everything that is, well, he delivers this speech where, everything that exists by its own 
sovereignty is a blasphemy to him. He wants to record everything in the world and everything that's outside of his recordings infuriates him. It mm. creates this narcissistic injury. And it's that, it's the certainty that just kills everything in its path. It has its own uh, circular logic. It's, and remember I told you the second Delphic Oracle, it's know thyself, mm. uh, nothing to excess, surety leads to ruin. I'd forgotten that. Yes. Surety leads, surety to, leads ruin. to ruin. And there's there's a discussion about surety because I think initially it was in the sense of when you offer a promissory note mm. or you offer to guarantee something. Yes. But it's also being interpreted as the English understanding of certainty. But it's when you invest, it's when you, surety leads to ruin, I think is a brilliant, and it's very few people, you know, know, mm. everyone knows know thyself mm -hmm. or nothing to excess. Yeah. They've very rarely heard the third one. Maybe we can. Uh, that surety leads to ruin has just has just triggered something in my um, adult brain. Uh, if no country for old men takes place in the same world as uh, Blood Meridian, in the same narrative landscape, and uh, Anton Chigurh and the judge are archons, there are there are archontic nemesis. What's the plural of nemesis? Nemesis, whatever. Nemesi. Nemesi. Um, Anton Chigurh has a philosophy and he's arrogant and smug and certain, but it's his philosophy that ultimately leads to his demise. We never see his demise, but we see that he's not as fucking clever as he thinks he is because he lives by that set of rules and he challenges other people and says, if the rules by which you had lived have brought you to where you are, what use was the rule? And at the end of it, he ends up in this, uh, it's, I don't think it's, most people have seen it by now, plot spoiler alert. He ends up being hit by a car because there's all these themes with Anton Chigurh and with the judge. They're like planets. Archons were represented by planets that operate inside operate inside of a clockwork solar system. Anton Chigurh says, uh, I don't want you to bring the bag to me. I don't want you to bring the money to me. I, I don't know. I don't need to know where the money is. I know where it will be. I think that's a reference to astrophysics and interplanetary travel. You point to where you're going to be. But by that same token, he ends up on a collision course by random chance. Nobody can kill him. The toughest people alive can only wing him because he's got, he's like the judge. He's of this world, but he's also of the other world. Something indestructible about him. And then some random soccer mum hits him and uh, T-bones him and his arm is snapped out of his arm. His arm bone snaps out of his arm. We see it. We don't see him get caught, but you get the sense that's probably the beginning of the end. Maybe for Judge Holden, maybe that was his last kill. Maybe somebody eventually turns around and scalps him. And, and it, I just wonder if there's something in that closed circuit. We never see his demise, but the last thing is that's uh, one of the last things that is said of him is he says he will never die. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's convinced he'll never die. Maybe he's maybe, maybe he's must, about from to. martial arts. You must have it's it's the same guy. The the undefeated champion will never be defeated. Well, yeah, eventually you will, yeah. mate. <laughs> Yes, there's no, no it's that thing. simple. Yeah. He can say what he wants. Yes. Death's coming for you, mate. Yes. There was, there was something that I found really fascinating with this thing of the judge being such a powerful, charismatic character. The kid is warned, this guy's going to kill you one day. Kill him now. And he points the gun at him and he can't pull the trigger. And I just think, just the questioning, like, why? But I, I also understand some people have so much character and are so much part of the natural order that you daren't do that. You dare not. It's some or, sort of a blasphemy or, or a transgression. And this is again, the enigmatic ambigu ambiguity, mm. or he chose not to, which is something the judge can't do. Why can the judge not? Because the judge can only kill. When in the book ah, the does ju the judge ever not kill? Ah, so the kid can the, make a choice not to kill. He's making a choice not to kill, but the, the judge, judge cannot do that. No, he can't because he lives by this rigid philosophy that war is the ultimate religion of man. Yeah. And if you if you don't kill when you can, that's the, well, the judge's Greeks blasphemy. had it different. The very the you know the very first word of uh, the Iliad mm. is um, menis. I think it's pronounced um, rage. Mm. The very first word of the Iliad is that right? Yeah. Rage and Hector and Achilles and all this. It's a war about a woman, and they go around killing each other. Yeah. endlessly. Yeah, but there's a the point. Um, within the Greek epics was there's an artistic formula mm. placed upon, like McCarthy is placing upon the judge. Yeah. The judge is being judged by art and found wanting. Huh. So right. just as rage, 
the Iliad is full. Mm. It's like one of your gyms and everyone's taken excess testosterone, mm -hmm. gone mad and <laughs> given swords and a few ships. <laughs> and no, some that... orange women have gone by and it's all kicked off. She's mine. Yeah. And <laughs> that umpa lump was mine. No, she's mine, fella. <laughs> The Greeks put a form on that. It's the story as old as time itself, but yeah. they put a uh, aesthetic form, like the Diary of the Seducer. Yeah. He's trying to put an aesthetic form on primal desire and turn it into something else. And that's where he, where he gets his kicks. Now, he's doing it too much. It's right. like Goldilocks. <laughs> he's, doing, he's introducing love to a purely aesthetic realm. Yes. That's not sustainable. Yeah. Yet you can't, if you reduce it to a primal animalistic level, that's not sustainable. Mm. It's this constant Apollonian versus Dionysian. We have Yin to versus get... Yang. It's this constant tension. You have to get and it right. Art is based upon an aesthetic representation of the tension. So maybe art then is the place in which we can safely simulate and practice getting the balance wrong so we can see without consequence. It's in the, I'm sure it's in the birth of tragedy, but actually there's, that's a line from Nietzsche basically says. Wonderful. Good. Of course it is art, because I'm a genius. He says art is error. Art is error. And the science, I'm not denigrating science, but we live in a society whereby science is the religion. That's the only thing that's listened to. Mm. And Science doesn't have, by the time you found out it's wrong, there's a new paradigm. Mm. And then you begin to believing that's right. Yeah. Would I'd argue if you're truly into art, if you're immersed in the notion that the only thing that truly exists is enigma and ambiguity and aesthetic form, yeah. then you're not surprised yes. when you're wrong. But yeah. the, and life will end in error. Life is error. This yeah. is Nietzsche's point. Yeah. Despite all the will to power and despite all the uber mention, all of this nonsense, yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Life is error. Go and live it. Go and affirm yourself in error. It's the Samuel Beckett, uh, worst would ho, uh, fail, try again, fail again, fail better. Courage. I think, I think I've messed that up yeah, slightly, no, but I, you know I, what I'm saying. I, th I think it's right. I think I know all of these things, they point to, the courage to make mistakes, the courage to live life rather than just live in the simulation, rather than live inside of Instagram, rather than live in the cave. Get out. Well, this type of interaction, I guarantee what we'll find most useful from this in retrospect is mm. when we think we've said something. Actually, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. You'll then say something to me or I'll say something to you and we'll revisit it. Yes. And that's how genuinely you make knowledge. Yes. And the knowledge isn't certainty. The knowledge isn't scientific fact. These yeah. are all these interpretations I've given. Yeah. They're all up for discussion. I'm yeah. not claiming guru knowledge. <laughs> this is absolute dogma and orthodoxy. But I will, one thing I can guarantee is confusion. <laughs> is there anything you would like to say before we... Well, okay, can we at one point, can we finish this? Because I'm not, oh, we, we haven't finished. got time. No, no, we've, we've got, remember the one, the painting, the um, Folly Berger. Okay, we have to do it quickly. No, 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 I'd rather do it another time. We'll do it another we'll leave time. Leave it as a teaser. We'll leave it as a teaser. What we should go and do is eat some Persian yes. lamb. Yes, yes. That's the responsible and moral thing to do. Dr. Paul Taylor, thank you very much thank for coming you. in. Really enjoyed that. And there's lots more for us to say. Yep. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gents, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. And we look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Thank you.